All right, before we get started today, I got a couple of thanks that are in order. First off, I got to thank Stone Slick for becoming a producer level patron and also Chad Streeter for becoming a VIP patron on the uh, Patreon app. If you don't know what the Patreon app is, uh, it's a way that you can support this podcast. Uh, if you sign up, um, there's uh, four different levels, a $5, a $10, a 25 and a $50 level. Um, and uh uh, you subscribe and uh, you will get access to all kinds of uh, exclusives and advanced notice on things and uh, uh, special podcast episodes, uh, which will only be available to you as well as uh, discounts at Chop Ahead, uh, some uh, Big Truth podcast swag, shit like that. So check it out at patreon.com slash big truth. Again, patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash big truth. Um, and, you know, uh, your support is much uh, appreciated and, and vital to uh, uh, growing this and, and keeping it going. So, uh, uh, again, utmost respect to everybody that signed up so far on Patreon. Can't thank you enough. Um, also, <laughs> holidays are coming up. And you don't really want to look like, you don't want your junk down there to look like a fucking, uh, uh, I don't know, like a fucking finger sticking out of a fucking bowl of spaghetti squash, squash right? So... I just make these shit up. I just make these motherfuckers up on the fly. So if I stutter through it or whatever, man, sorry. But yeah, man, you get what I'm getting. You know, you don't want your junk to look like a finger sticking out of a bowl of spaghetti squash. And if you know what I'm talking about, uh, you uh, got to go check out manscaped.com. Uh, you know, uh, Black Friday's coming up. There's all kinds of deals over there. So check them out. Manscaped makes the Lawnmower 3.0, which is the world's most advanced, scientifically backed ball razor. Uh, it uses these special ceramic blades. So it's a knit cut, abrasion, scratch, uh, you know, bloodletting uh, resistant down there. So uh, you can uh, shave away with reckless abandon and clean up your nether regions and uh, you won't look like a Sasquatch uh, or a total fucking heathen. Um, but yeah, go to manscaped.com and uh, they got all kinds of uh, uh, ball care products and, and all kinds of cool shit. And they have all these package deals and all kinds of ways you can save money and holidays are coming up. Give a gift, give a, give a, give a gift to somebody, you know, that's like a fucking walking woolly mammoth and, uh, you know, have them, uh, be a little more presentable down there, uh, for the holidays, um, manscape.com. And if you use the promo code big truth at checkout, you will get 20% off your order and free shipping. So there's a bunch of shit already on sale. So, uh, and there's a bunch of, uh, black Friday things going on. So we'll check them out. Manscaped.com. Use the promo code big truth at checkout. You'll get an extra 20% off your order and free shipping. Uh, also check out lawtigers.com. If you are ever in the unfortunate situation where you've been in a motorcycle accident and uh, you need some representation, uh, Law Tigers is a law firm that was founded by riders for riders. Uh, again, check them out, lawtigers.com. Uh, also, if you go on Facebook, uh, you go to Law Tigers, just type in Law Tigers and then whatever the name of your state is, and you will get in contact with their local office. Um, and uh, Instagram is at Law Tigers. Omerta. I know Omerta's having some big Black Friday sales, so uh, make sure you go check them out at omertamia.com. O-M-E-R-T-A-M-I-A. -A -A, uh, one of the best street uh, wear, uh, street, uh, street level, street wear, uh, street clothing brands out there. Uh, these dudes are, uh, are legit and old friends of mine, and they got the raddest shit out there. Um, one of the best clothing companies there is. In my humble opinion, uh, they got all kinds of shit too. It's just not t-shirts. Uh, they got jackets, they got bags, they got, uh, socks, uh, hoodies, you know, whatever you need. They even do like special edition, uh, limited screen prints, like, uh, prints, like, like hand screened prints and stuff, all kinds of cool shit. So check them out. There's all kinds of exclusive shit. Uh, uh, limited shit. Uh, and then, you know, they got the standards like stop glorifying rats and all that shit. Always in print that, that, that one is, um, but check them out. Omertamia.com. And again, if you use the promo code, big truth at checkout there, you will also receive 20% off your order there. So you're saving money left and right. So I'm, 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 I'm allowing you to give more for the holidays this year. You know, just, uh, just use my promo codes at, uh, at, uh, Manscaped and Omerta and, uh, you will get 20% off your orders, uh, at both of those venues, uh, Pitchfork 
If you don't know Pitchfork, they are one of the standard clothing companies in the hardcore metal and punk rock scenes, and they've been around forever. And uh, my boy Warren, who's paid so many dues in these scenes, is uh, is one of the guys that uh, that is running the show over there. They also do a record label uh, with this uh, limited edition uh, split seven inch series where they do a East Coast band on one side and a West Coast band on the other, and they come on all these different uh, limited vinyl colorways so you want to check them out at pitchforkny.com again pitchforkny.com and on all the social medias at pitchforkny which is short for pitchfork new york um chop cult is the leading kind of uh industry news and resource for uh chopper builders and motorcycle riders and uh online one of the biggest online communities there is uh for this stuff and uh you can check them out they have a online message board that is broken up into so many different subcategories so you can get whatever information you're specifically looking for they also have an online swap meet where you can uh, buy sell trade uh parts and uh other assorted motorcycle stuff um and you can um they have an events page that lists motorcycle events going on all across the world, broken up by country and state and whatever. Uh, but you know, they're just, uh, they're just cool, man. And the shit is absolutely free to join. So it costs you nothing. They don't ask you credit card or any of that shit. Um, and, uh, so the moment you sign on, you are part of one of the biggest motorcycle communities out there. All kinds of good information, all kinds of dumb shit just to help you pass the time. Especially if we get down this uh, rabbit hole of another round of shutdowns and you're looking for shit to do, uh, you know, go look up some motorcycle tech shit or some look at rad pictures of custom bikes or uh, go look for parts and all that shit at chopcult.com and uh, on all the social medias, simply at chopcult. Um, yeah, you know, and also check out Chop Ahead. Um, we're going to be doing a Black Friday sale where we're going to do 20% off all apparel and riding gear and helmets and everything we got in the store. So whether you come in the store, it's 20% off, or if you order online at chopahead.com, which is C H O P P A H E A D dot com. Um, you know, we greatly appreciate it. And we're a full service brick and mortar shop. So you come in here, uh, we have a uh, parts counter, we have a showroom, we have a a big shop in the back where we do all service and repair and build custom bikes. Anything you need from an oil change to a full custom chopper build, we will do it. Um, speed work, whatever. Uh, so check us out at chopahead.com or at 13 County Road in East Freetown, Massachusetts. Um, so uh, if you are not local, then, you know, just check us out at Chop Ahead and uh, you will uh, get access to a lot of the shit we got for sale. And if you don't see it, give us a call. We probably got it. And last but not least, check out BigTruthPodcast.com for more information on this podcast. And uh, I would greatly appreciate it if you if you subscribe to this and uh, spread the word, leave a comment, leave a review. That always helps. And without further ado, let's get into this shit right now. Yes, once again, we have liftoff. I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Big Truth Podcast, and I'm stoked to be here with my man Dave Wedge, who you may know as an author, a New York Times bestselling author. Sorry, I think we're almost okay. obli That's obligated okay. to say that, right? When <laughs> it, it's it's a badge of honor, so yeah, thank you. I appreciate absolutely. that. Worked hard for that one. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. That doesn't come easy. And then also uh, a longtime uh, journalist in the Boston area for the Boston Herald, amongst That's other... Right. Yeah. Uh, Amongst, like most journalists, you, you, you're, uh, you, you I've been around, yeah yeah, 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 a breadth of uh, magazines and uh, newspapers and whatnot. Yes, sir. So, yeah, I mean, if you don't know it, um, I'm looking at two of his books right here. He, he's made the uh, one of the, the Tom Brady books. Uh, what's it called? 12? 12, yep, yeah. yep, 12. It's uh, Tom Brady and His Battle for Redemption. Yeah. And that was that was the New York Times bestseller, that one. That came out in uh, 2018. And that's the story about Deflate Gate, kind of that whole yeah. saga. And it's, it's, you know, a lot of people get get mistaken with that one. They think it's like a Tom Brady bio, but it's really not. It's you know, there's a lot of biographical information in there, but it's really a story about how the league really tried to um, railroad Brady, you know, and, and they took this little 
equipment violation that was deflategate and turned it into like a capital murder case. And the the book actually reads more like a um more like a courtroom thriller. Huh. It's like a drama kind yeah. of about how the league and the union battled over that case. And and the the backstory is really that, you know, Brady is like this superstar and everybody knows that he's supermodel wife and he's Mr. Perfect and all that. But it, a lot of people don't know that Tom Brady is a big union guy. He was always there for the union whenever there was battles over the c- contracts and that stuff. Brady and even Peyton Manning would, would really go to bat for the union. So when this whole thing happened, the union had Brady's back. And if you remember, you know, Kraft and Belichick both kind of turned their backs on Brady during Deflategate. They were like, eh, go ask Tom, you know, and. But the union was there, and they they battled hard for him. So that's what the story's about: is is the union's battle with Goodell and you know the big bad NFL. And um, you know, I think the you know the moral of the story for us is that you know whether or not you like Brady or give a shit about what he did or didn't do, um, if the league can come down that hard on someone like him for something so minor, imagine what they can do to a player that nobody knows. Yeah, you know? yeah. So that's kind of the story. And there. so does that come out as well, like some other stuff, or does it just kind of more stay on the Brady story? Uh, no, we get into a lot of the stuff with the, the union battles with the NFL about other cases, like we talk about Bounty Gate, the one down in New Orleans where you know players were accused of uh, issuing bounties to, to hurt guys, basically. Okay. And then there was Bully Gate down in Miami. There was like some racist stuff, and players were being bullied, and obviously Spy Gate, we talk about that. And sure. then there was the Ray Rice case, which was kind of – a really nasty case. Yeah. You know? So, you know, the union and the NFL have been battling for a long time. And really what deflate gate was all about was Goodell asserting his dominance over the league. And that's mm. what he did. He actually, you know, at the end of the day, the league won. Yeah. Brady got his revenge on the field. And that's kind of what you read about in the book is, you know, he got, he, you know, he got his ass kicked in court, but he won on the field. He won that crazy Super Bowl that, you know, yeah. the Falcons and Goodell had to hand him the trophy. And that wasn't too, Good of a moment for Goodell, but sure. at the end of the day, uh, Goodell's he's the king, man. He yeah. still is. Well, you know, the thing is, you get involved mm. in like an industry like that, that. There's so much money, there's so much power play, and then there's you know, and then you know, in football, there's a lot of alpha males, right? And yeah. so then you get the guy with the league who's got to be the the head guy, you know, the yep. top guy, yep. you know. And so you, you know, just basic. It's almost a, 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 just a study in basic human psychology to- and totally. trying to stay on top of the food chain, you know, because because yeah. you know, obviously the the players outshine the the uh, the rep- you know, the league people, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, as far yeah. as popularity or whatever. And um, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's gonna be. I mean, there's so much. I mean, we jumped right in, yeah, yeah. but there's so much. Let's let's give a little bit more background information, and then we can go into all. Sure, the, sure, go sure. into the books, yeah. like because you know, um, you also have uh, Hunting Whitey, which you have here, yep. which was uh, you, you know um, the uh, the last chapter of the story in the the Whitey Bulger uh, <laughs> epic saga. Uh, saga <laughs> yeah, um, and you you wrote the book on the Boston bombing that became mm-hmm. became part of basically became the movie uh, uh patriots day that's right yeah and then also didn't you wrote the book on um the the uh, ice uh challenge there the, that the was, ice bucket challenge yeah, pete, pete frady's yeah, yeah. Bit, kid from boston college yeah. yeah and didn't that become the the thing on uh or like there was like a, that became a documentary we're, as well we're, right? we're, we're, no we're working on a movie on that okay. we're still working on it um we got some you know we were working with casey affleck on that one to try to make a, a film about it but yeah um, it kind of fell apart that project, but we we have since got a new partner that we're working with. I can't really say who sure, it is, sure. but um, I'm hopeful because I I love that story. You know the the Pete Frady. You know for your listeners that don't know, you know Pete Frady's was a kid from Boston College, grew up in Beverly, Massachusetts, and he got ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And yeah. when I started writing the book, I didn't know anything about ALS, but I learned quick. And um, he, him and his family basically said, you know what, there's no no cure, no treatment for this disease, and it's unacceptable. We're going to find a way to fight it. And Pete said right from the, from the beginning, he's like, I'm going to find a way to get this to Bill Gates, you know, people like that with, like, deep pockets that can fix this disease or find a cure. So he kind of stumbled upon other people doing the Ice Bucket Challenge for, you know— raising money for a cancer or raising money for, like, the local animal hospital. Some people doing it on on social media— and one of his ALS friends that also had ALS sent it to him. He's like, hey, check this out. We should do it for ALS. And the light bulb went off over Pete's head. He's like, this is how we're going to fight this thing. We're going to turn this thing into the ALS thing. Mm. And he branded it ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, and it went viral, and it raised $250 million. Yeah, it was great. crazy. So, we're, you know, that book was, you know, a very personal, you know, it was sure. an incredible book. But, um, 
I think it's a great story, and I, I hope we get to make a movie on it because it would be a really inspiring movie. Yeah. So before we get to the <clears throat> books, let's just go <clears throat> kind of over your general. I think, you know, for, for listeners who aren't, aren't as familiar with you, um, you know, just a general background of, like, how you even got into journalism and, like, you know, sure. the kind of trajectory there and how you went from – you know, starting off, like you said, over in Taunton as your first, yeah. as your first, uh, uh, a post and then, uh, getting to the point where you're writing books and, and Hollywood movies, you know, sure. like the, there's a, there's a trajectory there that's probably interesting for people to yeah, hear no, about. I, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I grew up in Brockton, Massachusetts. Um, I, you know, I, I did pretty well. I went to Brockton high and I always loved English and my dad owned movie theaters when I was a little kid. And that's, that's kind of. So I was always around the movie business and I knew I loved it and I loved to watch movies and I read a ton of books and I was like, I want to do that. You know, yeah. but I didn't know how to get there. I had no idea. Um, so I went to Boston college and, um, originally I was a business major and, uh, a marketing major and I, and I was, I, I, I started getting into the math classes and I wasn't doing great. You know, that's not where my, uh, my strength lied. It was, but my English grades were good. So I, yeah. I got an English degree and I, I graduated from, from BC and, you know, it was, it was the mid nine, early nineties and the job market sucked and I had no idea what I was going to do. And I came out of college with a, you know, a degree from Boston college and I was working at a sub shop and cleaning cars. Yeah. 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 You know, you know, my dad was like, awesome. Money well spent. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. Boston college for everyone. <laughs> if you're not from the area, know that it's not, it's not the price of community college. Yeah. Know? It was a, you know, it was an expensive education. So, but I, I, I knew, I knew I was going to figure it out at some point. Sure. I just told my dad, you know, be patient, man. But I ended up getting a job at the local paper in Taunton, like writing. I, was, I started off covering like local sports, just freelancing and part time. And then the police reporting job opened up and uh, I, I try, got a tryout for it and they, they hired me. And I now I had my first full time job and I was covering the police um, beat. So, so what's a tryout like for something like that? Like, what does that in, entail? Like, you know, you start off, <clears throat> you, you're doing sports and then the, the police thing comes up, like, and you gotta, so they want, they want to find out if you can write and handle news, you know, yeah. and, and handle breaking news and, and, you know, um, react quickly, you sure. know, that's what they want to find out. So what they'll do is they'll, you know, they'll give you like, you'll come in in the morning, they'll give you like two or three stories and they'll say, all right, you're covering these. We need them all done by five o'clock. You know, that's your deadline. And you just work for the whole day and get them done, you know. So I yeah. did it, and I must have done okay because I got the job. And um, I did that job for four years. And and I, I tell people when I talk about you know how I got where I am, like that job in Taunton was really where I like the rubber hit the road for me. That's where I kind of learned. It was almost like my boot camp. Sure. You know, I learned how to cover news. You know, it was back before cell phones, before the internet. Yeah. You know, you had to go out and knock on doors. You had to go to the police department and ask for police reports. You had to go to the courthouse and pull the actual court files. You know, you you couldn't just cl search something on Google and find all the answers. Yeah. Um, you had to go out and, and do stuff. So I, I, I feel very fortunate that I was able to grow up that way and learn the business that way because it served me well now that I'm older sure. and writing books and stuff. I, I feel like, you know, I still report that way. You know, I'll go yeah. knock on someone's door because you – you always get the story from the person, yeah. not from a document, not sure. from something online. You know, the yeah. story is in the people. Yeah, the do the document can point you to the people you need to talk right. to, but then yeah. you get more of the context when you're actually sitting in a room across. Yeah, listen, at the end of the day, man, I'm a storyteller, and like, you know, I want to hear from people. I want to yeah. hear, you know, if I'm writing a story about you, I can look up everything online and watch videos and all that, and I'll learn a little bit about who you are. But until you tell me your story, I don't yeah. know it. You know, so yeah. that's kind of how I approach my reporting. Absolutely. And, um, and so, so from there, um, uh, you know, where'd you go? After yeah. That? So I went, well, how I, long did you, how long did you, so I was there before? four years yeah. and then I, and then I moved to the paper in Attleboro for a couple of years and I covered a lot of crazy stuff there. And then eventually in 1999, I got a tryout at the Boston Herald and I got the job and, um, I, I worked at the Herald for 13 years from, from 1999 to, uh, actually 14 years to 2013. And, you know, I covered a lot of crazy stuff there. You know, my the first big story I ever covered was like my second or third week on the job was the Worcester cold storage fire when the six firefighters got killed out in Worcester. I got sent out to Worcester to cover that. So, you know, I was kind of thrown right into the mix yeah. on that stuff. Were you, was, was there a specific um, uh, department you worked in? I was general news. General, yeah, general so I started news. off in general news and, um, you know, I covered... The, uh, there was a massacre up in uh, Wakefield, the Edgewater Technology. A guy killed a bunch of his co-workers, covered that story. And then I went to 9-11 that morning. I got sent down to New York. As soon as the first plane hit, my boss called me and was like, get going. 
And I was like, why? And he was like, well, we think the plane went out of Logan. So I was like, all right. I knew it was a big story anyway, but now yeah. it's a big Boston story because we knew there was going to be a ton of Boston people on the plane. So I, I headed down. I, I reported from ground zero for like two weeks. And, um, you know, obviously, like everybody, it changed everything. Sure. And that changed the trajectory of my life. And um, from there, I, I stayed in news for a few more years. I covered the station fire down in Rhode Island, 2003. Yep. You know, serial killers, you know, corruption, scandal, all sorts of, all the stuff you read in the paper. I covered every single day. And eventually I got a little burned out. And um, in the mid-2000s, I went into the political uh, team. I joined the political team and I became the bureau chief at State House. And then I worked at City Hall. And But at the Herald, you know, such a small staff, you were always pulled back into the news you know sure. whatever the news of the day was and you know they knew i was a good reporter so they just whenever big stuff would happen they'd be like all right forget that you're doing this yeah so 2013 april 15th the bombs go off on boylston street and i'm i'm the city hall reporter city hall's closed that day i was just going to meet a guy for coffee and uh my boss called and was like yeah some some bombs went off at the finish line we need you to jump in so i kind of led the herald's coverage of that whole thing um after the police officer got killed at MIT that night, I was home. I just got home from work. I worked, you know, I was working 14, 15 hour days through that whole week. I got sent back out in the middle of the night after he got shot and I ended up in Watertown and that whole shootout. So I was in the middle of that. So I, you know, kind of led the Herald's coverage on that. And then a couple, you know, maybe a month or two after that, my co-author Casey Sherman, who was a TV producer that I had known from the business, got in touch. He's like, listen, I'm, I think I'm going to do a, a book about the marathon bombings and I need a good reporter to, you know, to help me out. What do you think? And I was kind of thinking about doing a book on it anyway. Yeah. So we teamed up and we've been working together ever since. Now, when you were covering the, the, you know, uh, the marathon bombings, you know, you say it was like 14, 15 hour days, like, like for how long, like, you know, like I'm sure, you know, it wasn't just, you know, that story was an ongoing story. Like, like how long is that? It's, it's gotta be like your life is revolving around that story for that, yeah, for that time. Yeah, totally. And like, how, how long of like, uh, you know, are you immersed in that? And like, you know, and I mean, you know, it's, I, I always look at it like, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not, you know, we're not first responders. We're not cops. We're not firefighters. We're not EMTs, yeah. but we're not that far from that either. You know, we kind of, you know, we, we, we work closely with them. We see them all the time. So we know them, they know us. So we help each other. They help us. And you just kind of treat, you end up treating yourself like that. Like you're just like, you know, their job, you know, the cop's job is to find out the bad guys, firefighters help the people that are hurt or whatever need rescue. And for us, it's like, we got to find the people and tell the story. We're going to let people know what happened. So yeah. you just, you do, you immerse yourself in it. And in the marathon, you know, story in particular, you know, the reason, um, why it was so personal for me was, you know, I lived in the city. I was sure. in Dorchester. Um, my wife was a reporter at the Boston Herald as well. And we had a our son was uh, two two weeks old. You know, she had just had our baby and, you know, the city went on lockdown. Yeah. So immediately after I got the call about the bombs, I called my wife and I was like, you know, why don't you take Jackson? He's our little boy. I said, why don't you take him and go to your mom's, get out of the city. We don't know what the hell is going on. We're under, under attack. Um, so, you know, you personalize it, but then you just... You know, for me, I just kind of worked my way through it. I, I just, yeah. honestly, I just became, yeah, you, you become a workaholic and just sure. do it, you know? Well, there's no choice, really, because right. if you really want to stay on top of it, shit's breaking yeah. by the second. So yeah. the, the, the four, but again, hour, it was four a, hours you're asleep, there's probably shit happening that you got to catch up on as soon as you wake up. That's right. It was a crazy time. And, you know, it was, again, you know, my wife's home with a baby and I was no help. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm like, she, she and she knew, but she, the good thing is she worked in the business. So she's like, yeah. I get it. Do your thing. Like yeah. it wasn't, she didn't even say that. It's just yeah. unspoken, you know? So she knew she was taking care of the baby for that time until it was over. And, you know, it was hard and it sucked and, you know, I'm not going to lie. It was, it, it was a little scary. You know, yeah. you're out there in Watertown. I didn't know where these guys were. And I'm standing in the middle of this, the smoke around. You don't know where the hell the guys are. You don't know if they're, yeah. they got more stuff planned. You don't know if there's bombs ready to go off, but very uncertain for everybody, but I just did my job and that's how you can, you know, control what you can control, sure. you know? Shit, my uh, heat just went off. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> I, I usually shut it off, so um, that's what that rattling is. Um, what, what's like, uh, and I, I mean, not to jump ahead, uh, but what's, 
was the was the marathon story was that like the sketchiest kind of situation you've been involved in in your career as a, as a as a journalist or a reporter or I mean nine eleven you know what yeah. I mean like not so when you you know for me anyway when I became a reporter um, you know the goal is to cover the big story you know you want to be yeah. on a big story but you know I always tell it this way it's like you know all of a sudden you know the two biggest buildings in America are on fire. And there's people jumping out of them for their lives. Yeah. And I'm driving into New York and people are driving out. Yeah. I'm trying to get down there to cover it. And it's like, at that moment, you just think like, you know what? I, I, I wanted to cover a big story, but not this big. You know, I didn't yeah. want to cover something that big. And, but then it's too late and you're just there and you cover it. Um, so that, that, that really kind of prepared me for the rest of my career. And, and so when the marathon bombings happened, I was well... I had covered some other terrorist stuff too. I covered the DC sniper. I don't know if you remember yep, that case. Remember and, that, and, yep. and like, and um, you know, I had covered some other terror, terrorist related stuff over the years. Um, and so, when the bombings happened in Boston, I was kind of like, okay, time to do it now in uh in Boston. Yeah. And you know, you just you just get into reporter mode and you do it. You know. So when you when you cover some of those other stories like DC or or uh, I know nine eleven is a, is a kind of a kind of a different thing, but like how long are you out in New York or DC for? Like you, you yeah, know? so for New York, I was down there for like two weeks down at Ground Zero, and you know, and then and then I'd come home, and then I got sent back for like the one month anniversary, and then I'd come back, and then I'd go back for the three month, and yeah. The thing that's interesting about that with with nine eleven, people forget, and a lot of your younger listeners that that probably may not even remember a lot of it. Um, there was fires that burned underground for like almost six months. Yeah. So when I would go back each time, you would smell that fucking fire. You sure, know? yeah. You're down there and you're like, okay, I'm back. You know, and it's yeah. it's something that just never, you always remember that, you know, things like that. So I, you know, I covered that for a long time. But um, with DC, I mean, I, I think I went down there for maybe like four or five days. That was yeah. a pretty short one. And I think, I'm trying to remember, it was so long ago, but... Um, I believe they caught him like right after I came back to Boston. And then I went back and covered sure. some of it more. Um, but with the marathon bombings, you know, I, I covered that for months. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. You're investigating, you know, station fire is another good example. Like, you know, you cover the event, but then my job is to find out what happened, yeah. why it happened, who screwed up, who didn't, screw, you know, who did their job, who didn't. And the, the station fire was a particularly uh, messed up situation because there was so much um, that could have prevented that yeah that wasn't done you know those people that you know, it was a there was a local inspector that like cut corners the people who own the place cut corners you yeah. know it ended up you know my job at that time was to dig out all those facts like who signed off the inspections what was actually on the walls and it ended up they had some flammable stuff on the walls it should have never been there the inspector should have found it and people ended up going to jail yeah. but people died because of that a yeah. hundred people. Yeah, I was gonna say a lot of people died. Hundred you know, people. You know. this, and and people forget there was two hundred people hurt in that fire, and a lot of those people weren't. It's not like they like twisted their ankle; like they were burned, disfigured. Yeah, disfigured. You know, yeah. lo- people lost their hands. Like yeah. it was bad. Yeah, I can't even imagine that situation. Mm. Um, yeah, someone who's been involved in music forever, yeah. like being in a club and like being in that situation, that's got to be, uh, you know, people. Even the people who got out physically unscathed did not get out. No, unscathed that, you know what i mean nah, and that, that was a sad one because you know i'm like you i'm an old music guy and like i you know i i kind of liked great white they didn't you know they weren't my yeah. favorite but i didn't mind them and you know that i knew i knew i had friends who had friends that were there you yeah, know it's yeah. a small music community in new england and you know i knew as soon as it happened i was like i'm gonna know people there like again i, I worked in taunton worked in attleboro covered music down there that was right in west warwick only you know half hour from taunton sure i was like there's gonna be people there that i knew and sure enough there was yeah you know? yeah and i'm sure not that it matters about me but yeah. i'm just saying that you know it was one of those stories where like everybody knew someone who knew someone like if you walk around shows in massachusetts and ask did you know anyone that was at the station i guarantee most people will be like yeah my friend or my cousin or my my cousin's friend you know yeah 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 there's not there's not a lot of degrees of separation yeah, for that yeah. you know? that was a really sad one it was terrible and i did feel bad for the band you know they, sure. they, they made a terrible mistake and they've spent the rest of their life really atoning for it sure yeah some people will never forgive them no know? no absolutely hold on i'm just gonna pause sure. for one second I- all right. I didn't mean to break momentum, but I had to pause because that uh, the heat being on in the background was so distracting, and I didn't want people to uh, to be distracted or shut off because I I I I hate uh, 
I hate when podcasts have bad audio quality. It's yeah. a pet peeve of mine, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I, I don't want to be one of those guys. So <laughs> You won't be. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But, but you know, I, I just I want people to be able to uh, not be distracted because you're getting into some uh, deep stuff that's uh, important stuff cool. in American history. Yeah. You know, beyond just, you know, us talking today is just – these are uh, – uh, very important historical events. Yeah, um, no, and that and that's a lot of the reason why I, I um, you know, that's the way I approach that kind of work. It's like, you know, nine eleven, the marathon bombings, you know, the Patriots Day, you know, that that book, Boston Strong, that we wrote about the bombings. Like, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, that's cool. You you met Marky Mark and you worked on Patriots Day and you made a movie. It's like. I guess, yeah, but it's like I would have rather written Star Wars where yeah. I could go party and have fun and be like, yeah, I wrote a fucking amazing science fiction movie, but yeah, yeah. I was put in a position Something fun. to write a story that had to be told, and was it fun? Like, no, I wouldn't say it was fun. Like, right. it was my job, and I'm honored that I got to tell those stories, but- you know, I wasn't like popping champagne and celebrating. Like no. I, I was sad, you know, I, was, yeah. I wish I never had to write it, but it's that, a, bit, a bittersweet victory. You know, I just feel like I did my job. You know what I mean? And, and that, like I said, back to the, you know, first responder thing, like when you get in a situation like that, you everyone feels helpless. Everyone, yeah. you know, when, when the city is locked down and they're looking for terrorists that have bombs, everyone's like, what do we do? And yeah. me, I had something to do. Yeah. Was find out what the hell happened. Try to, get as much information, keep people informed. So it gave me a focus yeah. and I kind of need that. That's just my life. Sure. You know? And it, what's crazy is what people don't understand is like a reporter, you know, these terrorists are still on the streets. We don't know what the hell's going on, but you know, like you said, the first responder stuff, you're on the streets with the first responders, you know, yeah, and I don't got trailer. a gun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, did you wear, did you wear body armor? Or anything? I, I, I didn't for that, but I have in the past, you know, I, I didn't for nine 11, I had a gas mask, but I didn't end up wearing it. And, and, um, you know, a, a lot now it's a little different with all this stuff, like reporters going out into the field for the riots and stuff like they're wearing full on body armor. They're wearing, sure gas masks and you know but i had a lot of colleagues in the business the photographers more than the more than the reporters because the photographers are immediately identified yeah. their cameras so um a lot of those guys would have bulletproof vests that they would bring you know they'd always have them in their car they carry them and you know in the old days in the you know the gang wars in boston the 80s like crack wars in like the late 80s and stuff yeah. those guys would you know when boston would have 150 200 murders a year um those guys would would wear bulletproof vests but I never really felt the need to, you know. Sure, yeah, yeah. I and and um, and so <clears throat> I could see how after a while, like you said, you kind of get burnt out from that, um, uh, going pretty much from crisis to crisis because you, you're not covering like yeah. happy local news. You're you're yeah. covering kind of hard hitting shit. Yeah, it gets uh, you get burned out. You know, you get real burned out, and it's you know, it's a high burnout industry. Um, the money is not great in journalism. You know, I made a decent living at the Herald and, um, I was one of the lucky ones, you know, I, I've kind of moved up over and over and, you know, I, I became an investigative reporter. I did like long-term investigations and stuff like that. So I, I have no regrets. I loved my career, loved everything about it, but, um, you know, to sit and say it didn't take a personal emotional toll at all would be a lie. You know, no reporter, uh, covers that kind of shit and doesn't carry some baggage, you know, sure. my wife included, my best friends that are reporters and, you know, but it's like any other business, you know, it's like prison guards or cops or whatever, like you joke around, you know, yeah. gallows humor gets yep. you through, you know, Absolutely. And, and we're in the newsroom and, you know, if people ever heard the stuff that was said in newsrooms, yeah. they'd be like, these people are a bunch of monsters, but, you know, you, uh, you know, one of my editors once said to me, you got to laugh or you'll cry. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of a true thing. You sure. Know? Yeah. Yeah, and it's not being mean spirited. It's just so that you can it's laugh. coping, to, coping to, mechanism. To cope. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, yeah, it's just humor breaks up tense situations, yeah. you know, or, or, or horrible situations. Because even if you're not seeing things firsthand, you are talking to the people that experienced them, and even just hearing, I'm sure, some of the horrible shit that you've had to sit through and, and hear. Like I, I can imagine that would be uh, mentally scarring to anybody. Yeah, it's the know? same. You know, therapists go through the same thing. You know, therapists sit and listen to people's worst, darkest moments day after day after day. Yeah, yeah. that takes a toll on them. You know, and um, you know, it's a, it's a weird thing what reporters do, you know, it's funny because, it, you know, especially now, but, you know, back then it was a little better. It's probably the worst I've ever seen it now, though. Like, reporters now have it worse than ever because the business is falling apart. 
the media has never been more hated or disrespected than right now. Yeah. But in my prime, when I was doing it and doing these stories we're talking about, there was still a little bit of respect for the business and, and the profession. And like people, you know, a good amount of people still understood that like, I'm doing a job and there's truth to be told and people had faith in me to tell the truth. Yeah. Now people, that's gone. Like people yeah. think reporters are just liars and scumbags and they're going to make shit up and fake news and all that. And that's unfortunate because all the people that I know that work in the business are very honorable and sure. they're only in it. They're not in it for the money. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're in it. They're in it because they believe in the pursuit of truth. And um, I hope that people can find their way back to seeing that, you know, the, are there people that, engage in fake news and peddling disinformation to make money. Yeah, absolutely. Is that all the media? No, yeah. you got to be smart. You got to, you know, the local news, pretty trustworthy, you know, the yeah. Taunton Gazette, Brockton enterprise, all, you know, whatever small Worcester telegram, the smaller local newspapers, you can trust those reporters. Cause they're not, I mean, they're making shit money. Yeah. They're yeah. just out to tell the truth. That's yeah, their yeah. job. They're, you know? they're, and, and they're not Anderson Cooper. You yeah, know, they're yeah. not, they're not Sean Hannity. Yeah. There's, there's not a, a, a political bias behind it, right. you know, because they're not working for a network that has a political slant and exactly. sort of whatever. Yeah. Exactly. That was actually, well, before we get into that, like, um, <clears throat> just to kind of get back. Sorry, to, I'm all over the place. Oh, no, 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 no. And it's fine. And, 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 and we'll, we'll go through it all, but just a, a, a quick, quick question. Um, you know, I know you said, you know, you guys will have like gallows humor in, in the uh, office to kind of cope with the shit that's going on. But like, in your, like personally, how do you shut some of that shit off and keep, you know, work life separated from, from, you know, you know, the rest of your life? Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, even me working in hospitals and crazy stuff, I saw shit all the time, you know, mm. and horrible stuff. And, um, you know, how did you, how did you kind of. Yeah, I, th I, th I think it's probably the same way you did. It's kind of mind over matter, you know. You just got to, you know, well, I mean, there was, you know, there's a high alcoholism. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of alcoholism in the industry. There's a lot of, again, a lot of burnout, a lot of depression. Um, you know, people get sick, literally physically sick, you know, sure, some, yeah. you know. Um, they're just worn down. Yeah, they're just worn out. You know, they get really tired, worn out, you know. But for me, it was kind of like, you know. I, I, I definitely drank more than I should have, you know, many yeah. times in my life. And, and I now know at this older age that that was a bad thing, you know, sure. but I think, um, you know, uh, most of it for me was, you know, I was just somehow able to just, when I got home, you know, put it away, you know, yeah. and it's not, on, again, not on like a cop or an EMT or something, you know, you deal with something bad and you can't come home and just dwell upon it, but, no. but it's hard to stop too, you know, and, then the other thing is, you know, the, your phone's ringing, you're getting information, you know, people calling you. And even if you want to shut it off, you can't yeah. because people are continuing to feed you information and, and you have to feed that back to your editors and the, and the paper. Cause if you don't, your competitor will, and then you look like you didn't get the Do story. Job, yeah. And you know, so it was, you become a bit of a workaholic. Sure. Yeah. But yeah. Because the news doesn't stop. Doesn't stop. <laughs> even though the even, news doesn't take holidays, doesn't, yeah. t doesn't take days off. It was, but you know, I lo like I said, I loved it. It was it was awesome. But I'm I'm glad I'm not in that grind anymore. It was a grind. Yeah. So something that you brought up, I'm glad you did because I wanted to ask you about this anyway. As, as someone that was a professional journalist, what's your take on media nowadays? And I'm you know I'm glad you said you know the small town or the local paper is still like a, a good trusted source. But as far as nationally, it does seem like it's very hard to find unbiased news nowadays. It is extremely hard. But I think you know smart people would do well for themselves to do their homework and take the time to find the outlets that don't have that bias. And yeah. I, it's funny, I've been having this conversation with more and more people these days, given the state of our nation and the election yeah. and all that stuff. But I think that, you know, you can always trust the Associated Press. You know, the Associated Press is an unbiased news organization. They have no political, they don't do op-eds. Yeah. They don't endorse candidates. They don't cover Democrats, Republicans. They deliver facts. Reuters, same thing. You know, they, they deliver facts. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think places like that, you can find straight news, just what happened. Here's yeah. what happened, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, and I think the local newspapers, you know, you get a good amount of that, but then you have the Herald and the Globe in a city like Boston or like you go to New York City, you have the New York Post, the New York Daily News, yeah. you read 
a story in each paper about the same incident, you're going to get two different stories Story, yeah. because they're coming from two different angles. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a bit of spin, but it's also style. So as a person who reads a lot, you know, you, you, you know, you have to just be able to read through that and yeah. you have to use your analytical thinking to figure out what's, what's spin yeah. an agenda and what's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've done this for 25 years. Sometimes I have to read it twice, you sure, know, and, yeah. and I can't imagine people that aren't trained. Yeah. Like a lay person. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just the average person. And, and now, you know, you have Facebook and all that shit and people well, can post I don't think, so, I don't think social media is helping much. It's made it worse. It's made, I mean, it, it's made it a lot more well, volatile at yeah, least, you know, you know, you asked me the state of media the, to me, the biggest problem in this country politically is confirmation bias, which yes, is absolutely, you know, anyone can Google their opinion and yep. find a, some sort of news article to justify yeah. their opinion and then put it on social media. And that's how all the fighting starts. Yeah. And, well, it's, and it's, it's kind of awful. Not, not only a, a news article, but they can find a group on like on, yeah. on Facebook or yeah. something of yeah. like-minded people. So all you're hearing is from those people and, that's right. and, and you're not hearing. I think one of the things that we're missing in the country now uh, more than anything is, is people having debate or on, on, you know, or just, you know, talking shit out or nuanced conversation. Now it just seems like people are, di I think so much, we're getting so much news now. People aren't able to digest it and they're just reacting to headlines. Yeah. And then, um, or well, the first couple paragraphs of a story, they're not getting into the nuance of it and they're just reacting on that and that and that. And then, yeah. you know, no one, no one gets to talk shit out anymore. No. And you said with the confirmation bias, they're only listening to the people that are yes in them. Yeah. And, uh, and then the people that don't agree with them are now the enemy. Right. And you, and you can't talk it out anymore. You know, it's crazy. Well, you know, there's a couple of things. I mean, you know, J JFK always said, you know, you're loyal to your nation, not your party. Absolutely. You know, people have to remember that, you know, on both sides. You know, yes. you, you, this isn't about I'm loyal to the Democrats or I'm loyal to the Republicans. I'm yeah. loyal to the country. Like, what's best for our nation? Yeah. People and forgot I, that. I, I think more than anything, the... The, it seems nowadays the politicians have forgotten that. More than, and, I totally agree. I, totally. I always say that, you know, yeah. everyone's going to stop putting the party before the country because Absolutely. the country's suffering. Yep. And totally, totally agree. And, I, and I, I'm hopeful that that will start to happen, that we've gotten through a bad time in, yeah. in our nation's history and, and we'll move towards that. But the other thing is, you know, um, with the 24-hour news cycle and, you know, social media and, you know, a million channels on TV and, you know, yeah. you can just consume details yeah. and facts all day long, never yeah. nonstop. And so our new book that comes out in uh, December is, uh, it's the 40th anniversary of the murder of John Lennon. And Casey, my co-author, Casey Sherman, and I wrote a book with James Patterson uh, reinvestigating that case. And I'll, we can wow. talk about that a little bit, but sure. it's called The Last Days of John Lennon. And I know you probably can't talk about it too much. I can't talk too much about <laughs> yeah. it, but you know, um, you know, working with someone like James Patterson was just an incredible opportunity. But sure. the bottom line is that you know, that was 40 years ago. So, you you know, you, you and I kind of remember when John yeah. Lennon was killed. You had three, three channels and you got the news at channels. six o'clock and, and the then, newspaper. And, that's and then it. that was it. <laughs> and everybody thought about it for weeks, for weeks and weeks and weeks. We sat and thought about John Lennon got killed. What happened? Who killed yeah. him? How did this happen? We love that guy. People, are, you know, now there's a, there's a news story of that scope every two hours. Yeah. You know, we have like, you know, Trump does this and this country bombed this country and there's a attack here and there's yeah. this person died and this person yeah, yeah. got indicted for rape and, the, you know, yeah, the drug yeah. bust here and, the, and yeah. it, fire yeah. and, 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 you know, and, and California's Epstein's on fire. Killed Epstein's killed, killed, killed in prison. Yeah. And it's like the news cycle just literally is nonstop. I know. And so like, no one can ever feel anything anymore. And on top of that, like we're numb. And, and what does it take to be like a story that lasts weeks now? It has to be like there major isn't. fucking disaster now. Like I, I don't even think that does. I think that I where I do have some hope is, you know, the these docu series and, and the great investigative, um, you know, long form pieces that have been done, like this trial four that's on Netflix about the Sean Ellis murder in Boston, yeah. like cases like that that are. Um, you know, done very well. Like I, I think the, uh, you know, the OJ, I think it was called Made in America. You know, that was a really powerful series. I think that's the kind of stuff that can make people look at something in a bigger context. But on a day to day basis, like these stories don't last. I mean, even yeah. Jeffrey Jeffrey Epstein. That's might be the craziest story of the last twenty years. It's already gone. It's already gone. Yeah. No and, one cares and, anymore. And they got they got his 
the, his partner there, uh, yeah, Giseline, 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 and that's gone. Out we of may news. never find out what happened. Yeah, you know, and, and it's like, oh no, we will move that trial a year from now. What? You know, not, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to get too political here, sure, but, you sure. know, but I, I'm, I'm make no bones about it. I don't like Trump. I'm not a fan of Trump, but um, I think that you know everything that's happened with him. Like, look, this guy was impeached. And that seemed like, right now it seems like it was a million years ago. Like, no one even remembers why or how it happened. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it, and then the next day it was on to something else. And then it was something else. And he fires the general and he fires this guy. And he withdraws us from the WHO. We're fighting with the CDC. He's fighting with Nancy Pelosi. And it's like, it's this constant flow of chaos. And, yeah. and it's like, no one can ever really understand what's happening, you know? Yeah. And I don't blame him for that. I really don't. I, I blame, you know, th there's no follow-up. Because yeah. there's no appetite for it. No one cares. Yeah, they just move on to the next thing. One of the next. What's the next shocking thing? You know, it, right after that, there'll be you know Kim Kardashian did this, or oh, you know yeah. this this athlete you know did broke that. his leg. It's like, it's uh, Twitter is a big part of it. You yeah, know? And I, it, it almost seems like people's. But you know what? There's also like you said, there's kind of a backlash against that now. Like, like podcasts people things. are rebelling against it like, absolutely like yeah. i never thought like even when i first started this people were like oh you those are too long you got to do it and then i get so many more so much more feedback from people saying oh man it was great you know even i didn't even think that was three hours yeah. or whatever or like ones i listen to i'm like yeah. you know i have to break it up into three chunks but like you look forward to it and i think people are you know do have people do have an appetite for more nuanced 100 percent. Uh, i i totally agree and, that, and that's a good thing. But it's like you said, even like those Netflix series that go more deep into investigation on things. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, especially with things like, like Netflix or HBO ones or things like that, things that can be a little more unfettered from like network TV and, mm -hmm. and, and, and have a little more uh, f freedom to, 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 to really go into things and mm -hmm. even show some of the ugly details or, or discuss it more and uh i think that i think that's been a good thing as well i agree with, yeah with yeah and yeah. i think that's where you know the, there's some hope you know yeah. I, I mean but i even but I even think, in this too like there's a lot of audio documentaries now that yep. i've been and ian's put me on to some and, and it's like that's interesting like produced yep. podcast mm -hmm. style mm -hmm. audio documentaries. Yeah, storytelling you know yeah. it's 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 you know people want to be told a story and there's a lot of people that do see through all the bullshit that we're talking about and they don't want to be fed that every day. So they yeah. find other ways. The good thing about, you know, everything that's going on with the, you know, technology is that you can, again, confirmation bias, you can always seek out and find what you want. You know, yeah. people are into hardcore, they're into bikes, they're into, you know, a little bit of counterculture. They can find you, you know, yeah, they can yeah. find your show, you know, and, and that's, that's a cool thing. But what's frustrating to me as someone who's worked in media and, and now, you know, authors and in Hollywood for the last 20 years is like, you know, the stuff that is mass produced and mass marketed yeah. is a lot of bullshit. Sure, a lot yeah. of it is a lot of bullshit and people are being fed it and they're just too lazy or too tired or too, you know, apathetic to really look elsewhere. And it's like, okay, okay. You know, Oh, that's what happens, you know, because yeah. they so and they just accept it and movie based on something, and, yeah. and it's like, you know, I just you think know, it's Texas it's Chainsaw Massacre was loosely based on something, you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? You know, it didn't go yeah. down like right. that, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's, it's just crazy. it's easy, you know, for the news, you know, and and the news again. I don't, you know, my friends in the news work really hard, but they're under a lot of pressure too. Their jobs yeah. are on the line every day, you know. It's going to be crazy to be in the newspaper industry right now. With like the newspaper industry is in big trouble. I mean, yeah. there's not magazines, a lot of jobs. everything, yeah, magazines. TV news, the local TV news. Yeah. I mean, you when you know, got four thousand channels, like yeah. what? The, it's like almost like you um, understand why a lot of this bullshit's happening, and it's mm -hmm. and they, you know, they got to get your attention. Yeah, but it's it's crazy. Like some, but some of the local news, and again, you know, we're we're talking about we're up here in Boston, you know, so like a channel like Channel Five, like Channel Five has a lot of integrity. They have a lot of smart, good reporters that work really hard, and they deliver good solid news yeah. you know and that i think that people need to just find that stuff and if you're interested in the news and you want to find the truth find reporters and people that you trust yeah you know but and that, that's good though it's a good it's a because i'm i do get caught up in like the psychoticness and craziness of all this but it is a breath it's overwhelming uh, but it's a breath of fresh air to hear like someone that's on the inside perspective can say look yeah your, your local news is probably a good trustworthy source or kind I, of stick I believe to that. so. I mean, but even that you do have to, 
you know, sift through a little. You have bit to of- sift through, and and you have to make sure that you know you're, f- you know, you do your homework like you yeah. do with every. Like, look, you're not going to buy a car from a a car dealership that's shady. You yeah. know what I mean? You you you'll. You know, when you're looking into a car, you're gonna do read the reviews and see if it sucks, you know, and see if there's problems with it. So, yeah. you know, do the same thing with your news. Like, if you're getting your news from one media outlet, like do a little research on the media outlet. Like, who are these reporters? Where do they come from? Yeah. What are the big stories they've covered? Why do they have credibility? You yeah. know, do your homework. Yeah, yeah. It's it's tough to tell that to guys or, or gals nowadays, though. You know what I mean? Because it, it sucks. Yeah. You know what sucks? Who is wants that, to do work? You yeah. Know? <laughs> you know, a lot of people are working two jobs. Well, not now. You know what I mean? But you, you know, like. Outside of any lockdowns and whatnot, you know, people are overworked and stressed and getting bombarded with so much uh, yeah. uh, media and whatnot. It's, I, it's, I think it's you're a, right, though. That, that's why the podcasts are doing well, is yeah. because people, they can find a personality of someone that they trust and they yeah. appreciate, you know, and, yeah. you know, you you look into some, you know, you look into some of these pot, you know, that's why Howard Stern's so great is because a lot of people connect with him. Yeah. They trust him. Yeah. They sure. think he's telling them the truth. You know, they don't think he's bullshitting because he's yeah. not. Yeah. Or even like you, you, so you get into like a podcast like Dan Carlin and like hardcore history and stuff like that. You know, he goes, I, I, I love heard that one. I got to check oh, it out. Oh, you got to check that okay. out. And it, it, it's like a really highly rated podcast. And, and when you get into things like that, or even like guys like Jordan Peterson or this and that, like when you see that there's like academics that are, um, you know, populist academics, you know, they're not speaking above people. Mm -hmm. Um, But when those people start to have big followings, I mean, that's always a breath of like, uh, you know, it it makes me like stoked. Like, yeah, not everyone's just absorbing garbage all the time that there, there are good messages and, and, and uh, uh, more interesting things uh, getting out there. Yeah. I I think a lot of people are, you know, I think a lot more people are in the vein of what we're talking about right now. Like a, you know, smart people see all the things that I just mentioned yeah. about the media, the flaws in the media, and they've already moved on beyond it. Yeah. And they're getting their information from other places that, you know, they may be, you know, listening to more music or they're finding podcasts or different yeah. shows. You know, there's a lot of great, you know, like NPR, for example. NPR is another one that I would recommend to people like, you know, the AP. NPR, you know, there's, there's definitely like opinion shows on NPR. Yeah. But- there's also a lot of shows that are really, really well researched and they're, you know, you're just getting the facts about yeah. them and, you know, take a look around. I, I think that a lot of people are finding really good content these days. You just got to, you got to put in the work. Absolutely. And once in a while, you just got to take a deep breath and take a step back and go for a walk yourself. in the woods yeah, man. and just be like, all right, <laughs> shut all this shit off for a second yep. so that you can come back with fresh eyes and, 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 and critically look at things again and not get caught up in the muck and mire of it you know i agree yeah um so all right so so you you made a jump at some point where you got out of news and started getting into book writing and yeah. you know what's what's kind of like what's been some of the hurdles for you uh jumping out of like you know being in a news cycle into now you're getting into you know you're not writing a news article you're writing a book which mm. is you know i mean you know i know you probably with a lot of stories wrote a series of articles on, mm-hmm, on a mm-hmm. story, but you know, what's kind of like the difference, like going from doing that into like, now you got to organize it into like a, like a tome, you know? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a big project, you know, when you start these things, but um, I'm lucky in that, you know, I found Casey Sherman, my co-author and, and, you know, so there's two of us to kind of push each other and, and kind of, um, you know, drive each other to, to get the story. Sure. And so Boston strong was a bit of a, you know, that was a bit of a, a fire drill to pull that together. It was, you know, it was breaking yeah. as we were writing it. And um, so it was a big project. So but you were it, writing it as it was still going on. Yeah, we wrote that in, um, in, you know, we started writing it in early 2014. So, you know, the trial, that book came out before the trial even happened. Okay. So um, we, we moved pretty quick on it. And we, and we already, you know, Patriot's Day was already in production when the trial was going on. So yeah. that all happened pretty quick. But um you know, to answer your question, I, I think that, you know, once you are free of that constraint of the newsroom and, and, you know, having to answer the bell every time there's a big story, you can kind of focus on the story at hand. Sure. And, and I did that. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been awesome. I've now written, um, Casey and I have done five books together Yeah. and, uh, we've got a good partnership going and I, you know, I love, I love what I'm doing. I get, I get no complaints. I don't miss the daily news grind at all, yeah. you know? Not to get into, you know, 
you don't have to get into too depth uh, detail about it, but what's the division of labor like when you're writing a book with someone? Because that's kind of interesting. And like, how mm. do you decide who handles what and who's going to do what on the book? Yeah, no, we get that question a lot. Um, whenever K- Case and I will go out and do talks together, and that's always a question people yeah. have. Um, so. You know, again, we're on our fifth book now, so it's pretty seamless. You sure, know, it's, sure. it's like when you're in a band, like the first time you jam with a dude, like y- yeah. y- you're like, uh, what's this guy doing? Okay, what's he doing? You can figure it out. But eventually it gets to the point where you're like, one hand knows what the other hand's doing. Yeah. That, that's where Casey and I are now. But the divisional labor, you know, we'll literally break the book up into sections. Like Boston Strong was a little different because, like I said, it was a fire drill. And like I was still, when we started that book, I was still at the Herald and then I left. So I was still covering everything. So I was just pulling together all my reporting and then we'd get together and figure it out. But now like um, for like the Brady book, for example, like Casey literally wrote the first two sections and I wrote the second two sections. So, um, you know, with Whitey, same thing, this new hunting Whitey book, which we'll get to in a a minute, but um, you know, Casey wrote the first two halves and I wrote the second two halves. So he wrote about, you know, how Whitey, escaped and went on the run and how he was captured i wrote about the trial and his life in prison and we just split it right down the middle okay yeah. that so, said um i may interview someone that may have stuff that's more relevant to his section and vice versa and we'll yeah. kind of feed it to each other write it up in story form and then we edit each other so sure. like he edits my stuff i edit his stuff and then we both give it a final read over and then you know then it goes to the editors and so it's that, a long process but we're getting pretty good at it so when you edit each other's stuff does that help it look does that help it make it have one more one like kind of coherent voice versus it like does. Hit, all right, that, oh, obviously that's Casey's section and obviously yeah. that's Dave's section, you know, you know, so to kind of, kind of get away from that. Yeah, it does definitely. But we also have similar writing styles anyway. Anyway, um, all right. He's, you know, he's probably, he writes in a little bit of a more narrative sort of um, novelistic sort of way. And I'm kind of learning from him on that sure. because he's written 13, 14 books, you know, yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm now at five, but, um, you know, and I'm getting my own style now, but, uh, you know, we we kind of we both write we're, we're telling a story about nonfiction, so yeah. we have to stick to the facts. So sure. we can't be too creative. Yeah, yeah. But there are ways to be creative. Well, you can't be like Hunter S. Thompson and right. <laughs> so, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. But we do. You know, we are. You know, when when you read the Lennon book, you know there, there is, and I mean, obviously James Pat, James Patterson kind of, you know, he's the and was you know he's the guy that pulled that all together. But sure. um, that one was certainly a little more creative writing than anything else I've ever done. And it was fun to do, you know, it was cool to like be a little creative and imagine and, you know, use a little poetic license. Yeah. So when, when you were writing Boston uh, Strong or when you guys were working on that, when did you know it was time to like, like, it's always interesting for me to find when someone does like the, the, the jump, like, when did you know it was like, all right, now, now is the time I need to leave, you know, reporting Mm. behind, like, how, how did you know it was, yeah. Or was no, it more just like a leap of faith? No, that's, saying- that's a great question, man. Cause, um, you know, I, I had a couple of chances to write books earlier in my career. Um, and I actually edited a book for a, a colleague, um, about a crazy murder up in New Hampshire. Um, and then there was a, there was a guy, do you remember the, um, what was his name? Oh man. It's gonna, there was a, a horrible murder. A guy killed his wife and, and his baby. And, um, you know, someone wanted me to write a book on that. So there's, there's, but it was never anything that I was like, you know what, I'm going to take a year out of my life and yeah. and just write this. Nothing really hit me in the heart like that. And I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm kind of a passionate sort of dude. So I, if I'm going to do that and put that kind of work in it, I'm, it's going to be something I really give a shit about. And it means something to me and it means something to the greater good. So when the marathon bombings happened, I, I almost felt obligated to do it. I was like, sure. I have all these contacts. I'm with Mayor Menino every day. I know Governor Patrick on a personal basis. I can talk to him. I know the commissioner, Ed Davis. I can call him right now and talk to him. Um, I know all these cops that were out there. I know all these firefighters. I know all these survivors. I just felt like I had a great position to tell the story. And I was like, people are going to write this story. I should do it because I feel like I can bring a sense of authenticity to it. Yeah. And I think we did. So that's what gave me the impetus to jump. I was like, you know what? Um, I'm going to do this book with Casey and I'll see where it goes yeah. and where it took me was out of the Herald. Sure. I was just like, you know what? I'm done with that shit. You know, yeah. time to go. Yeah. Was it, a, was it, was it kind of hard to, it's very kinda, hard, man. Yeah. I, I cried. I cried the day yeah. I left. I mean, 
20 years I worked in newspapers and, you know, it's the only career I knew. Yeah. And, um, you know, when, when my, my Herald career was finally over that day in the newsroom was very emotional. Sure. My wife likes to give me shit. She'll show <laughs> me that picture. She took a picture of me. I had, I was like wiping my eyes. Cause like, <laughs> my editor was like telling some stories and I got a little weepy and yeah, I was like, yeah. but you know what? Like I, I came of age in that newsroom. Like I had my daughter when I was, you know, my daughter was, um, was 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 uh, only a couple months old at nine eleven. You know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. And, and um, you know, now she's twenty one. You know yeah. what I mean. So, my son was two weeks old when the marathon bombings happened, and you know now he's seven. So, um, when when that stuff happens, and you work your way through that, and you're doing the intense level of work that I was doing, y- you can't help but be emotionally impacted by it. Sure. You know? Plus, I, I'm sure you must make bonds with. Other, your coworkers, oh, yeah. who, like, because you guys are in like the, the family, the man. You're, yeah, yeah, you're family, in the shit yeah. together, so yeah. it's almost like. Well, my I met my wife in the newsroom. Yeah, you know, yeah. we 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 met covering stories together. You know, we yeah. we covered nine eleven together. You know, she, I was, I got sent down to um, New York, and she got sent to Logan, and we're talking on the phone like, what's going on? And she, she's like, I have no idea. She's at Logan. She's like, they just locked down the city. I'm like, what do you mean? We didn't know what the hell was going on. Yeah. So you know when you leave. You know, and I did that for, you know, again, 14 years at the Herald and yeah. made some great friends and people that are my family, you know, like you and your work, you know, they're just yeah. family and everything happens. Everything's part of the journey. Yeah. You know, absolutely. I'm on a different journey now. That's yeah. all. You got to, you got to do that in life. Like at least like, it sounds like it, it was like you knew when it was time because, because of the story itself and yeah. you you were going to be one of the better people to tell that story, if not the best person to tell that story, you know, just because of how ingrained you were versus someone coming in from the outside, trying exactly. to, trying to, yep. you know, retrace everything. Yep. You were there from yeah. the minute. It that was, it's funny you off. say that. So, you know, it's funny you bring that up because that was actually my biggest thought and people can call Sam bullshitting or whatever that I was just doing it because it was an opportunity to make money. They can say whatever the hell they want. But the truth is, is I was like, people are going to tell this story. I don't want it to be some dude that parachutes in from some other city, comes in here, exploits the story, makes it into some crazy chaos that it wasn't, and then goes back to their life and, 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 you know, moves on. And I was like, you know what? I care about this story. I'm, and Casey and I talked about this. We were like, you know, we're going to be the guys that wear this. When Patriots Day comes out, we're going to be the ones. If people don't like it, we're here in Boston. They're going to be like Casey Sherman and Dave Wedge screwed this story up. Yeah. They're not going to be going after, you know, Pete Berg and Mark Wahlberg and CBS Films who are out in Hollywood. They're going to yeah. be coming after us. Sure, yeah. So we felt like, you know, we had to do everything in our power to make sure the story had integrity. The good thing about Patriots Day, and I, I guess I'm jumping ahead, but the good thing no. about Patriots Day is that, you know, Pete Berg and Mark Wahlberg and those guys gave a shit. They sure. really cared. You know, Mark, people can, again. The Boston guy. Yeah, people can criticize him all. They were, oh, Mr. Hollywood, whatever. That dude still has family in Dorchester and Quincy and Braintree. Like, he's, yeah, yeah. you know, he can't show his face around here if he screws up the marathon movie. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. So he cared a lot, too. and. And uh, I think they did an amazing job. Was it perfect? No. Was my book perfect? Absolutely not. But what is it yeah. tells the story. We think it makes people feel something, makes them understand what the hell happened. And I think, you know, 50, 100 years from now, I, I hope people will read my book and watch Patriots Day and understand what happened that day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, it, you know, the the uh, it's when you said, you know, you know, some guy come in from out of town to do this story. Like, I don't know. I mean, I know New York is like this, and I know certain cities are like this, but it's a Boston story. It had to be told by Boston people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a, there's, that's a thing in Boston. Like, yeah. I don't think anyone would have gave it as much credibility if it was some some guy from, you know, whatever. Tuscaloosa right. came right. in. I, I don't want to even say other big cities, you know, right, but like right. if someone came in and told this story, it wasn't a Boston people story. I don't, I don't think people would have gave it as people, people would have been all over that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that, you know, I think that the filmmakers knew that they needed local reporters with credibility. Yeah. And so they were happy to partner with people like me and Casey, but by the same token, I don't think anyone but Mark Wahlberg could have done the story justice. Now, you know, again, was it perfect? No. Is, is, you know, but Mark Wahlberg has the credibility in Boston and, and beyond. You know, you can't have like, you know, I don't know who, who you want to think of for, you know, Ryan Reynolds. You know, you can't have Ryan Reynolds come in and do that, do that yeah. role. 
Um, you know, but I guess maybe he could. I don't know. He's a great actor. You know? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But I, 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 I kind of agree with you that I think that at the end of the day, the best decision was to have Boston people involved. Yeah. It insulated you from a little of the criticism of cashing in, quote unquote. Sure. You know, and and that's a lot of you know as you know old hardcore guys like we are. You know, you're always cautious of that yeah. selling out label and all that stuff. And, you know, for me, I mean, yeah, I get paid for my work and, and I make a decent living and I appreciate the paychecks when I get paid for my work. But, yeah. um, you know, I could go do other things for a lot more money. I, I love what I do and I take it very seriously. And I believe that um I was, you know, I have the skills and I was kind of put here to tell stories yeah. so i'm going to tell stories about what i know sure. i'm not going to tell stories about shit i don't know you know yeah. so I, I'm, I'm proud of it yeah. yeah and now you have kind of more of the freedom to tell stories that you that you know or care about and, and care absolutely about, yeah you know, versus yeah. not just reporting on the, th the newest thing to pop off you know yeah yeah no it's it, you know casey and i are in a pretty good position i mean we've had a good run with some great stories and we've got some great material and now we have like a following and so all our books do pretty well now, but um, you know, I, I I'm I'm always looking for my next great story, you know, and I, I want to continue to to do stuff that I care about. I'm not yeah. doing it just, oh yeah, you know, here's here's some money, write this story about this thing you don't care about. Yeah, um, that's not where I'm at, you know. So it's been a pretty well before we get into that, but like, <clears throat> how did it work? Um, you know, from from writing Boston Strong to to kind of the jump like where you know that was kind of. Uh, worked in the Patriots day, like did, 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 did that, like, did the book come out first and then they saw that and then yeah, so brought that, you guys that, in? So this is a, you know, a, a lot of your listeners should understand, like my career trajectory is not the normal one. Yeah. Um, I busted my ass for 20 years as a reporter. And, and like I said, I, I, you know, I, and, and that's why I like telling the story. I like, I like people seeing like, you know, in life you pay dues, you yeah, do things yeah. and then it leads to different things. And you, you might not know where, where you're, where you're going, but if you kind of trust in the process, take a, take a chance on yourself yep. and, and, you know, make the jump when you need to, like, you know, good things, you know, could yeah, happen. Yeah. And, I, th I think, you know, I, 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 I had a reputation of being a hard working, accurate reporter. I, I was a grinder. I worked hard. I, you know, I like to think that people thought that I, I, um, you know, I was aggressive and I would always do my best to get the story. So, I think when, um, you know, when Patriots Day came up, Casey knew that, you know, he had a good reporter to partner with, um, and that was important to him because yeah. he had already built a brand for himself. He had, um, written, like I said, he had written, I think, seven or eight books before that, and one of them was a, a book called The Finest Hours, which was made into a great uh, Disney movie with Casey Affleck and Chris Pine. It's about a... Uh, Coast Guard rescue in 1953 off the Cape, off the coast of Cape Cod. It's like kind of a family movie. It's, sure. it's an awesome story. And him and this other guy wrote that book and, and it kicked ass. So the finest I was movie had just come out and w and when the bombings happened. So Casey was just coming off that. So he already had like Hollywood agents and all this stuff. So when he got in touch with me to do this book on Patriots Day, he was like, oh, and by the way, we're, we're probably going to, be asked to turn our book into a movie and we'll be part of that process. So again, this is not the normal course of, of business for people that do what I do. But as soon as we got the deal for the book for Boston strong, I already had a Hollywood agent, you know, and, and, yeah. and they're still my agent today. So I was thrust right into that world in my first book and that sure. doesn't usually happen. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a huge story. And yeah, you know, but it wasn't like your first book, like, you know, you just got out of college and it was the first thing you wrote. Yeah, like no, I said, mean, you already had a season veteran. Year. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, you yeah. know, so it was like, you know, and I, I just look at it like, you know what, it, like I said at the beginning of this podcast, um, I knew at a young age I wanted to write books and movies. I just didn't know how to get there. Yeah. And all my hard work got me to that point. Yeah, you, did, yeah. you know, and so I don't. I don't I'm sure there any... was plenty of times when you were just uh, like working at the paper. You didn't think that was going to become, you know, yeah, anything I, into doing movies. But it, there was times it, I thought I'm, I'm never going to write a book. Like I said, there was you know different books that came across, and I was like, eh, I don't know, I don't want to do that one. And, I, and then in yeah. my head, I'm like when am I ever going to do a book? Am I ever going to do a book? Or am I going to retire and never have written a book? Cause a lot of journalists do that. They spend their life thinking about writing a book and they never actually write it. Yeah. But I'm fortunate enough that it all fell into place for me. And I, you know, now here I am five books later. Yeah. You know? And, and I'm doing, I, I love it. Love cool. it. And, uh, what's, 
you know, you're the the books that you guys have written together kind of there's not like you know, like there's a lot of people that are true crime writers or there's a lot of people that are like uh, sports writers or music writers. You guys are bouncing all over the fucking place. Like, yeah, like, yeah. um, you know, like what's the process like? Like, how do you find your next, you know, and you kind of started talking about this a yeah, little yeah. bit. Like, and, and I definitely want to talk about the books themselves too. Yeah. We already touched on a, a little bit, but like, like what, what is like, is there a process or like, how do you find your next story or does just something come up and you're like, that's it. That, that's the one we want to move on. Yeah. Kind of that. But I think, you know, we're always looking for a common theme and, and the common theme is like underdog yeah. or overcoming an obstacle, some sort of redemptive, you know, feel good sort of ending, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, that might sound weird with a book like, um, ice bucket challenge where the kid got ALS and he died last year, but there was a very, inspiring quality to that sure. where that guy took a die look everyone's gonna die every yeah. one of us right yeah and his family talked about this with us very early in the process he said pete looks at life this is pete frady's the kid who had als and yeah. created the ice bucket challenge he said pete looks at life like everyone's gonna die he's just dying a little faster than everybody else yeah. and he wants to do what he was put here on earth to do before he dies yeah. and that was raise awareness for als and find a way for people to fight this disease and he found a mechanism through the Ice Bucket Challenge. So when we're looking for stories, we're looking for that. You know, it's like, that's not a sad story. It's yeah. You'll cry. Like, people will read it in this sad moments. You know, it's very sad what happened to Pete Frady's. But there's also things there that are like, yeah, man, like, I got to find ways to do better in life. You know, yeah, if, yeah. if he's sitting here and can't move and he's, you know, can't even hug his own daughter, but he still has the gumption to get up every day and fight and work and what am I crying about? You yeah, know? yeah. So it's like that sort of thing. I like, I love that quality in stories. And I think all our books have it, you know, the, the Whitey book, you know, um, that's not, it's not a, you know, our Whitey book. There's been a lot of books written about Whitey's, like yeah. co the corruption, the FBI and how he, you know, played all the, all the undercover cops and all that stuff. We get into a little of that, but our story is really about the FBI agents that caught him, how they caught him. And they're kind of the heroes, but it's also about how he stayed on the run, his life on the run. What was it like? And how did he die in prison? What happened to him in prison? So, you know, we're always looking for, you know, the story behind the story, yeah. I think. Well, yours is interesting too, because most of the stuff that's been written about him has been like, the early stuff or like what he did and exactly. this and that. And you're, you're, you're kind of given the final chapter. Yeah. We give the greatest hits. Like you have to understand the context. Like the guy killed 19 people that we yeah. know of. So you have to know a few of them, yeah, but yeah. our story isn't like in 1962, you know, yeah. those books have been written, you know, yeah. those, our story really, it starts from um, the day he really went on the run until the day he was murdered in prison. So that's it's the like you said at the beginning, it's the last chapter in the saga of Whitey Baldron. Yeah, and it's a, again, it's another one. It's funny, um, you know, when the marathon happened, I told you I was like, all right, I'm in a kind of unique position to tell this. Well, Casey and I never wanted to write a Whitey Bulger book. We actually were like, that story's done. That story's screw that. You know, everyone knows that story. Whatever, whatever, whatever. But when he got killed in prison in October 2018. Our agent actually called us and was like, you know, why don't you guys think about writing a Whitey Bulger book? And we were both like, I'm not, no way. Yeah, Every, yeah. It's been written to death, you know. And then we were like, well, you know what? Someone is going to write the last chapter of this. Why shouldn't it be us? We're the, you know, we're the guys, we're the Boston story guys right now. Yeah. We know everybody. People are going to talk to us. And that's what happened. You know, once we decided to do the book, the good news was because Whitey was dead, it freed up a lot of people to talk. People that didn't want to talk before talked. Yeah. They weren't afraid anymore. You know, the FBI opened up their files for us. We got over 70 letters that Whitey wrote to an inmate friend of his in Tucson, Arizona. And that guy gave us those 70 letters, and they're in the book. So when you read this book, a lot of the stuff in there is directly from Whitey himself, which sure. has never been done yeah. before. Hmm. So the book's very different. Yeah. And it was awesome to do. It was fun. Yeah. So I think something you touched on, I think that's important um, or interesting is that, you know, not only you guys, the Boston guys and tell the Boston stories, but you guys are known in the area and the community and people will talk to you because you've yeah. established a, a level of credibility um, and, and probably, a, you know, obviously a level of trust with people um, that makes it easier for you to tell stories because people will be more apt to open up to you. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, is that something, 
is that something that's developed more as you know along the way you know as a reporter and it's carrying mm -hmm. over into the book thing or is that like something more like when you've been doing the books you've been kind of open up you know, more lines there. I, I think it's both. You know, I think, you know, the older people like our age and older, they know me from the Boston Herald. They know I'm the guy that covered X, Y, Z or wrote this yeah. big story. You know, they might remember one or two stories that I did, but there's also people that won't talk to me because they remember a story I did 15 yeah. years ago. And they're like, that story was shit. And that guy <laughs> screwed this guy. And, yeah, yeah. you know, so that happens too. But I think, you know, Casey and I have built up a reputation, you know, nationally now that, you know, um, we can, we can tell a good story. You know, our books do well, people like them and, and I think they're a good read and, and, um, you know, so it, it opens a lot of doors, you know, yeah. you know, when you talk about Whitey and stuff and, you know, people now, now that he passed, people are more willing to talk about certain things, you know, there's still, you know, guys around, you know, from those days, like, was there any concern on your part from any, you know, like, like any repercussions from talking about any of this shit yeah, there, there was a little bit i mean you know uh <laughs> yeah you know it, like the bulger family like they have relatives that are not happy with me and casey about that book you know sure. they think there's something they were mad about you know i interviewed billy bulger the, yeah. the father you know I, I'm, I'm sorry the brother yeah um you know, we, it got back to us that some of the people in the family weren't happy that we did that, but it's like, I'm going to do my job. Like that yeah. guy has a story to tell and I'm going to try to get it, you know? Um, but you know, I'll tell one quick funny story. So there's a guy named Pat Nee. I don't know if you, you might know the name Pat. Yeah, nee. so, know name, yeah. so Pat Nee was, was, he's a gangster, you know what I mean? He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a killer. You know, the dude has, um, you know, he was implicated in several murders, moving bodies around, digging up bodies, burying them. Uh, he was a bank robber, served 20 years for armed robbery. Um, the guy was a career criminal. And uh, when when it was announced that Casey and I were doing the book, I got a call from an attorney, this guy I know, Steve Buzang, and he's like a famous kind of mob attorney. He he represented uh, Cadillac Frank Salemi and some other mobsters over the years. And Steve called me, and, uh, you know, I, I had known him from my days at the Herald, and he's like, hey, uh, you know, Pat Nee wants to talk to you. And, you know, I'm like... Okay, what does he want to talk to me about? He's like, I can't tell you. He's like, but he wants to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. So we set up a meeting, and uh, I met him at a, a sub shop in Southie, you know, and and um, I don't know what to expect. I don't know if this guy, you know, I knew a little about Pat, but I didn't know a lot. What I knew was not good. And I was like, you know, what the fuck does this guy want to talk to me about, you know? So I, I, got, I made sure I got there early, you know, and I, I did the old back to the wall thing. So yeah, I'm yeah. looking, I see yeah, the yeah. whole place <laughs> and I'm in this small sub shop in Southie and all it was like a little old lady and they came in together, the lawyer and, and Pat. And in my head, I'm like, all right, he could be like pissed because we're writing a book about Whitey, about Whitey and he might be Whitey's friend and he might be here to send a message to me or maybe he's got some information. I don't know. It could go either way. Yeah. Yeah. And so to be honest with you, like it was a very tense experience but uh within a couple minutes he sat down and uh he put me at ease because he hated whitey uh. and the reason he wanted to talk to me because he wanted to shit all over whitey <laughs> and say you know if you guys do one thing in this book you expose what a fraud he was and a liar and he's sneak and he's not a noble gangster and all that he wanted to dispel that myth of whitey as the noble gangster yeah and you know it's all in the book but sure yeah so you get those experiences, but you know, I sat face to face with the guy and it was quite an experience, you know? Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine, you know, in, you know, whether you're doing the stuff on the Boston bombings or, or that or any of those type of situations, like there's got to be like, you know, some, some aspects of it that get a little dark or a little tense. All, when, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I came across something that you, you did a piece on like a, a cult Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did a few pieces of yeah, yeah. cults. Yeah, yeah. No, I've always interested in like weird shit, like especially in Massachusetts and whatnot. Yeah, like, yeah. what was what was what was that like? So I did a, I did a cult. I think you're talking about the Attleboro cult. Yeah, with the the, the, the babies. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was a dark case, and uh, that's one that you know we'll, we'll probably revisit in some form. I, I actually it, there could be a series there or a movie, but it, it's so dark, man, because yeah. it, it, it involves dead babies. You yeah, know? And, yeah. And people don't like dead babies. No. Uh, amazingly. You sure. Know? Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's probably a good thing that. People yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I covered that story. I actually covered that story when I was at the Attleboro paper, 
I started covering it, and then I continued to cover it when I got to the Herald, because that was one, when you asked earlier, you know, you follow these stories through your career. Yeah. Um, and that story went on for years. So what happened was there was this cult in Attleboro, and they were like kind of a, a fundamentalist Christian sect, and they uh, very, you know, no TV, no newspapers, no outside contact. They were chimney sweeps. All the guys, that was their business. They were like masons and chimney sweeps, and all the women just stayed home and reared children, and they lived off the land, and they... You know, they were very, like, back-to-basic, sort of Puritan style. And um, one of the, you know, one of the women had a baby with the leader of the cult, and uh, one of the other women didn't like the woman who had the baby with the leader of the cult, and she came up with this kind of twisted vision that said, um, so the baby, the you know, the woman, they all breastfeed the babies, but then they graduate to table food, and this kid had already gotten to table food. And um, one of the women came to the cult one day at one of their meetings and was like, she, I had a vision from God that Karen, her name was Karen, that Karen's only supposed to breastfeed Samuel. That's all. He's, he needs sustenance from, from the bosom, you know? And that, so she basically delivered a message from God to this cult that she had to only breastfeed her baby. Well, anyone that's had a kid knows that once the kid's off the breast milk, they're not going back. Yeah. They, once they get a taste of table food, they want Cheerios, they want orange juice, they want milk. And, the baby wouldn't attach to the breast anymore and he wouldn't eat and he starved to death over over weeks. So they starved the baby to death in this house that they all lived in and they all covered it up. They brought the baby up to Maine and they buried it. And uh, there was another, there was a couple of babies that died during birth, like stillbirths and, you know, those were suspicious as well. So they buried two babies up in the woods in Maine mm. and it went on for years when no one would ever say what happened. The fam neighbors said there was a baby there. Now it's gone. Because the baby was like one. It yeah. wasn't It wasn't, it wasn't like two months. months. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So people knew like, yeah, they had a baby, but now it's gone. But they're all still there. So DSS started looking into it and the cops. And, and they knew that a baby was gone, but they didn't know why. So it was this big mystery. Yeah. And they eventually found out what happened because they were able to flip one of the women, led them to the grave site, and they found the baby. Oof. So And they all got charged. And actually that cult leader and the woman who came up with the vision both got convicted of murder. Mm. It was a crazy story. Yeah. Man. Now, dark. With were these people like were they born into that? Was that like a existing type of lifestyle? Like, and I'm not I'm not comparing them to like Amish or, or yeah, any yeah. of that stuff, but like how that is an existing thing, or was this something like where people were like part of regular society and then like dipped out and did that? Some of them were from a family that kind of grew up that way. Okay. They were comparable to Amish, but they were more like Christian scientists. Yeah, okay. where they didn't believe in doctors, and they would okay. like they wouldn't take their kids to get vaccinated or yeah. you know checkups anything. They believed like pray, you know, yep. just pray, and that's what happened. This baby starving to death, and instead of like just giving them food, they were all like, "Let's pray for Samuel to take to the breast milk." Like that's what they did. Yeah, and the baby friggin' never did and he died. So um a lot of them, you know, there's a couple that married into the family. Um, but most of them, you know, the core of the group was born into the family. And the okay. father was like kind of the overbearing dude that made them all act that way. Yeah. But the ones that married in ultimately were the ones that made the case break because they were like, All right, this has gone far enough. This yeah. is screwed up. I gotta I yeah, gotta speak yeah. up, you know. Yeah, because it's just a it's wild always, case, man. Yeah. I can't. That's funny you found that one. Yeah, because yeah. you know the thing with cult stuff to me is always like, how do you even get into that shit? You know what I mean? Like you know the process. So so, so it makes sense if there was a family and that was just kind of intergenerational. So, so the way thing. it was described to me, and I, I I talked to so many cult experts over the years for that case, and I did another one about a a group in um Plymouth in uh, Vermont called the um the Twelve Tribes, very similar sort of group, and they were involved in some child labor like they had all the kids work at their factories like these kids were like 10 and they were yeah. you know they got in trouble for that so beating the kids stuff like that but um the way it was described to me by these cult experts is that um the reason why cults are allowed to exist and and kind of fester is because one or more of the people in the group are viewed as having a direct pipeline to god yeah and when they or whatever the spiritual being that they all believe in. And if they deliver a message from that spiritual being or God, everyone takes it as gospel law. Yeah. That's it. And, and for some reasons just it's unchecked authority and it's, it's scary. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, you know, being here in Freetown, we've had our share of of of, of, of high weirdness around here. Yep. So it, that stuff is always of, of interest. But I, I covered that stuff. Did I mean, you? The Freetown Forest. Yeah, did the, you, the did, Mar- Mary Lou Arruda murder. I covered yeah. that. Do you know that case? Yeah, th- that's the one where they found her. Uh, they found her tied, tied to, to a tree. tree and, yeah. and um, I covered. Uh, so the guy that killed her was a guy named James Cater, K A T E R, and um. He had four trials because he insisted he didn't do it, and he kept getting um, hung juries and all this stuff. So he, I covered his actual last fourth trial, and uh, you know he was convicted. It was, yeah. it, but it wasn't that wasn't a cult thing, but it was one of those stories that contributed to the uh, mystery of the Freetown State Forest, where there was supposedly a satanic cult that was down here, and yeah. they thought Mary Lou Arruda's murder was the result of, of a satanic cult, but it wasn't. It was this scumbag and, yeah yeah but there was some weird shit like they sacrificed animals out there and some weird yeah, shit went on they found a couple of like weird structures that yeah a bunch there's of some shit. weird stuff yeah um so the john uh, lennon book um that's coming up uh did you talk about as much as you can with that or is that something? yeah i can talk a little bit about it you yeah. know not too much i don't want to piss off james patterson you yeah know, but, yeah yeah um you know, Casey and I again. You know, we had just finished. I mean, uh, what's the crux of the of the so, of the book? Yeah, yeah. So the crux of the story is, you know, it's the 40th anniversary of the murder of John Lennon. So, yeah. um, you know, guys like you and I remember it, but people, you know, 40 and under don't really know the story. So, yeah, the idea was let's go back, reinvestigate the whole case, pull all the case files, reinterview everybody that's alive, and kind of reconstruct the whole case and tell the story of what happened, you know? And and what happened is, is that, you know, John Lennon, um, had become a recluse. He was underground, you know, he, he had his son, Sean with Yoko and he was living in the Dakota and he was um, persona non grata. He just stayed in the house. He was a house husband. He was done with being a wild rock star and he was, is all finished. And, um, you know, shortly before he started, he did get back in the studio and they started recording the album, which ended up being his last album to start, um, uh, double fantasy. Yeah. And before that happened, he wanted to learn how to sail. He was like doing a, uh, you know, he's kind of going through an existential crisis. He's like, let's learn how to sail. So he went down to Newport, Rhode Island and he hired a guy to teach him how to sail. And they went in a sail and, they had a horrible storm. They almost died. They almost got caught in like a crazy storm, him and Yoko and Sean with this guy. And we actually interviewed this guy who took him on this trip. Yeah. And um, after that happened, John kind of had a, had an epiphany. He's like, almost like, you know, he was, he was in the, he was driving the boat in the rain and thinking they were going to die. And he was like singing. And, you know, he had this moment where he was like, all right, life is back. I'm, I'm alive again. You know, he had a moment where he was like, I'm alive again. And after that happened, he kind of came back into the public eye. He released uh, Double Fantasy, started doing some interviews, started getting back into the public eye a little bit, and that's when everything happened. So yeah. this guy, Mark David Chapman, who killed him, um, was a loner, lived in Hawaii, and he was just this obsessive, crazy guy that um, he had all sorts of different targets. He wanted to kill President Carter. He wanted to kill uh, President Ford, he wanted to kill uh, Todd Rundgren, you know, a yeah. 70s rocker, just yeah, all these weird, weird people. Random, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Orson Welles was one of the ones that was on his list. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. just had all these old, you know, he just, he wanted fame. He wanted to find someone famous to kill, and he ended up settling on John Lennon. Yeah. And we kind of tell that whole story about how he came to settle on Lennon and yeah. what happened that day. See, I didn't know that he had, I didn't know that. Like, he had, he had a whole list, hit yeah. list of yeah. people. So did this, I mean, without, I probably because you don't want to get into spoilers or specifics, but did did this reinvestigation uncover new stuff or any any big, th- big yeah, kind I th- of I th- like I things? Th- I think so. You know, I I I, I don't want to say there's any no. major reveals because I mean the case has been covered ad nauseum, but I think we pull together the whole story and tell it in a way that people have never heard before. Sure. And it's um, you know, we definitely you know found you know we dug out a few nuggets that I I think people will. You know, some people will know, but I think most people won't, you know, like a lot of things about Mark David Chapman's history and a lot of things about John Lennon's history. And and we do have some, you know, some fresh interviews with people like Paul McCartney um, that we got to interview and and some other folks that, um, you know, witnesses to the case. We talked to the, the lead investigator on the murder. We talked to the prosecutor. We talked to Chapman's attorneys. And I think all of them bring, you know, Kind of like the Whitey book, like Whitey's dead, so people can talk freely. Yeah, it's forty years, so they're like, all right, I can tell my whole story now. It's been forty years, and they kind of took the handcuffs off and told us 
the truth. So I think there is some new perspectives yeah. in there. Yeah. So you think with, with time that just kind of happens, people just feel a little more yeah. removed from it and they're a little yeah. more comfortable talking about the whole thing, you know, cause obviously there's not anything major that's going to bite someone in the right. ass with that, you know, now, you know, right. maybe, you know, but, um, I yeah. think there's that, but there's also, you know, with age comes new perspective, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, people get older and the things that were important to them when they were 20 or 30 or 40 yeah. are not as important to them when they're 40, 50 or 60, you know, yeah, and they, yeah. they look at things through a different lens. Life is different to them. Yeah. So when they tell the story now at this age, it's a, you know, it might have a different levity, you yeah. know? Now, is it, and this is not, I'm not trying to be devil's advocate here, but it's just a, a legitimate question. Is it harder to get people back into that frame, thinking about that thing, those things that happened 30, 40 years ago. And like, you know, is it like, uh, you know, do you have to do more research, like kind of like double checking facts to make sure like, you know, what someone's memory might mm. be like 40 years later yeah, yeah. versus like, if you asked them 20, you know, like right. if you ask me something 10 minutes from now, I might have a different <laughs> answer. You know what I mean? Right, you know, right. never mind. you know, decades passing. Is, is that something you guys like have to really do diligence with? Yeah. I think, you know, you want to check, the veracity of the information, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, make sure that they're not telling you something that's impossible, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you not know, that they would even, not, not, meaning and not it, that they're no, doing it no, on it, purpose. It, it, yeah. Just, it would be, it would be accidental obviously, yeah. but um, yeah, we certainly uh, vetted all the information that we had as best we could. And, and um, you know, you cross reference everything. And, you know, yeah. one thing Casey and I do is, you know, we don't leave any stone unturned when we write our books because, yeah. You know, we're kind of nerds about it. Like, sure. we, we want to nerd out and just find out everything about it. Like, you know, we, we went down to New York. We spent, you know, a ton of time down in New York for this book. And, you know, we went and sat at Central Park and had lunch and just, uh, you know, there was actually Beatles music that came on on the, um, on the you know, the speakers at the place we were at. And we just sat there and kind of, like, you know, talked about the story and just kind of nerded yeah, out about, yeah. about the Beatles, you know. And, I think, you know, when, when we write our books, we try to get into the story as much as we can. Sure. Um, and, and, and that includes researching all the past information and comparing it to the current. Yeah. And is it hard to get at someone like Paul McCartney to do, to do yeah, this? Yeah, it wasn't easy, wasn't it? You know, we, we, we tried to, you know, Ringo wouldn't talk to us. Really? We made contact with him and he responded, but he was just like, I can't. Um, you know, he didn't want to talk, but, um, yeah, it was, we had to jump through some hoops. To yeah, I can imagine. Party. Yeah. But you know, we, you know, for the Brady book, you know, we got, we got Brady and yeah, that wasn't yeah. easy either, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, I feel like that's a little easier just cause you know, at, at the time he was still around here, you know what I mean? True. <laughs> true. Yeah, that's true. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, yeah my, you know, um, but you know, that's, that's also part of the fun of writing these books is who can we get? You know? Yeah. And, yeah. And, um, you know, with the Whitey book, for example, you know, we were like, we should try to get Billy Bulger. And, and, um, I was like, all right, I'll, I'll go to his house. And, and that's, that's how I ended up getting him. I just went to his house, yeah. knocked on the door. Knocked I knew, I knew where he lived, just knocked on the door and he answered. Yeah. He knew me though, you know, cause I had covered him when he was at the state house in Massachusetts. Sure, he yeah. was a state Senator. And yeah, yeah. he was like, hello, David. And I was <laughs> like, um, Mr. President, you call him Mr. President cause he's a Senate president. I was how you doing, Mr. President? I said, uh, you know, told him what I was doing. I'm here writing a book about your brother and you know, he was murdered. I'm very sorry for your loss. And would you like to talk? He said, sure, come on in. Invited yeah. me in. I sat at his kitchen table for an hour and a half. Yeah. So, you know, you never know. You know, you these interviews know. can happen or they don't. Yeah. So, you, you know, like when um, <clears throat> when any of these books come out, obviously there's some controversial stuff in there. Has there ever been any big, like, blowback on there or any big kind of, like, ramifications on that or f <clears throat> from any of that for you guys? Um. We've made a lot of news with our books, but yeah. we've never had, you know, I want to knock, get some wood around yeah, here. Man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Knock on wood. Um, <laughs> I'll knock on this metal here. Oh, but the bench on the yeah. bench on. Oh, yeah, there we go. There <laughs> we go. But, um, you know, we, you know, we think we do our homework enough that, you know, even if someone was upset about something that they we wrote, read, yeah. they're not going to say it's not true. And, yeah. and we can, you know, we can always fight back on why yeah. it is. And, you know, we haven't had any you know, any major blow ups like that, you yeah. know, but, but like the Brady book, for example, we had some big news in there that, you know, he found out, um, about, uh, about Kraft dropping the appeal from the TV. He didn't know. Yeah. You know, Kraft never called him and was like, we're dropping the appeal. He was sitting at home watching TV and he saw it. 
dropping the appeal to the defl- yeah, yeah, Deflategate sure. case. And that was a big deal to Tom. He was like, of course, yeah. He was like, what the fuck? He's yeah, like, I've yeah, been the like, great company man and you guys are just throwing me under the bus. Like, yeah, yeah. He was pissed, you know? Yeah, and, how much he did for that team and they're not going to stand behind him. Yeah. He was pissed. And him and Kraft, they had, they had a rocky relationship for a little while because of that. They repaired it. Um, and a- another thread in that story is that, you know, Tom's mother was, was going through cancer that season. And, um, you know, so him and Kraft kind of bonded over that because Kraft had lost his wife to cancer. And yeah. that's kind of how they rebuilt the relationship was they bonded over the, you know, the family sure. uh, illnesses. And, yeah. you know, ultimately, you know, him and Kraft fixed their relationship, but him and Belichick really didn't. Mm. Yeah. Well, so. it, it's hard not to feel betrayed in that type of situation, you know? Well, and at the end of the day, they're all professionals and... And I think it's one of those things where, like, you know, you can still respect someone and what they do for a job, but you don't have to love everything they did. Yeah, you know? absolutely. You covered a lot of music in the past, too. Yeah. Like, yeah you, I, and I know, you know, you just get into the John Lennon thing. <clears throat> um, you know, what, what's, uh, what was, what's been some of the highlights for you uh, in your career as a uh, journalist in, in regards to uh, music stuff? Oh, man. I mean, this, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. How long you got? Well, you know, what, what are no. some of the, the standout moments for you? Yeah, just to, no. to kind of get on a more lighter yeah. note a little bit. Yeah, you know? no, We've been absolutely. talking some heavy shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I, I wrote every paper I was at, I, I kind of wormed my way into the music section to yeah. cover stuff that I like to do and... Um, was there it, like freedom for that? Like, yeah, you know, if like yeah. you, if you were the, the press guy and you're, you're covering a murder one day and you'd be like, yeah, I want to do a record yeah. review one day. Yeah. Well, the, it's funny the way it happened was, um, I didn't know you could do that, but what happened was that when I was at the Taunton daily Gazette, um, down in Taunton, Massachusetts, I was the news reporter. I was a police guy, but they, they would post a, a listing of all the concerts at great woods every, every season, you know, great woods is the amphitheater yeah. near, near Taunton. And um, I asked one of the coworkers, I was like, what's that? They're like, oh, well, you know, the Great Woods gives us press tickets for every show. And if you want to cover one and write a review, you can go to the show. So I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is funny, actually. So I went to sign up and everything was gone. Like everything was already taken. The only concert that was available was Yanni. Yeah. You know, Yanni, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the like, you know, uh, new avant-garde, age guy. new age dude. So I was like, screw it. I'll do it. It was my first one. I had never covered a concert. I had gone to concerts, but I had yeah. never written a review or anything. So I went to Yanni. I got two tickets. I brought a buddy of mine, and the show was awesome, dude. Yeah. It was like a really good show. And I was like, I don't like this music, but I can't give it a bad review. Like the guy's great at what he does. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So I wrote a great review of of Yanni. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, from there, I kind of learned that, like, you know, there was ways to kind of work work the angles to get to shows and interview people that I thought were cool and wanted to do. So after that, I. I kind of made friends with the the woman who ran the features department and I was like, listen, I'd love to do more stuff like this. She's like, absolutely. I need, I need the content. So yeah. I started doing features and all that. And, um, you know, so you asked, you know, what are some of the highlights of what I've done? Um, you know, when I was at the Taunton Gazette was, uh, you know, 1994, I believe it was, um, kiss put their makeup back on. Yeah. And I was a big kiss fan growing sure. up, you know, as a little kid. Yeah. And, um, I got Any it. kid in the seventies was probably a, a Kiss fan at some point, right? Yeah. And um, it was funny because you know there's no email, you know there's no internet back then, yeah. so I would get mail, and and I got a mail, I got a press kit from Kiss just randomly because they had seen that I reviewed music over the years, you know, or, or for a year anyway, and I got a press kit from Kiss, and it was like you know a black and white photo of Kiss, and it's like a press release to like Kiss putting the makeup back on at Boston Garden, it was, I think it was the Fleet Center at the time. And they're like, you know, interviews available. So I immediately called the guy and I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to cover the show and I want to interview Kiss. And the guy was like, all right, great. We'll set it up. Sets up an interview with Gene Simmons for me. Yeah. So this is a great story. Too. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm sitting there. So my job at that time was I had to come in at like, like five 30 in the morning and I had to go to the Taunton police station and the Rainham police station, and read all the police reports from the night before. If there was a big story, go write it for the paper. The paper came out at like 11 in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I would have to go to the courthouse and cover all sorts of other stuff and all that. So for some reason, the interview was set up for like 8 a.m. Yeah. Because Gene was in New York and he liked to do his interviews in the morning. So I'm sitting there, I'm on deadline. I had like, I'm writing about like a, a robbery or a fire or something. My phone rings. I'm like, Dave Wedge, Taunton Gazette. And he's like, hi, this is Gene Simmons. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, uh, Mr. Simmons. I was like, uh, 
I forgot we had this interview scheduled. I was like, I'm in the middle of another story. Would it be possible for you to call me back in like 20 minutes? And he goes, no problem. <laughs> and he goes, thanks. And he hangs up, finished my story, 20 minutes. Gene Simmons calls me back. Consummate professional. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, such a smart guy. And, you know, there's a lot of things people don't like about Gene Simmons, but it was just, that was a moment in my career where I was like, you know, I realized the professionalism of some people like Gene Simmons is one of the biggest rock stars in the world, but he's trying to sell his new band, putting yeah. their makeup back on. They weren't getting a ton of press then. And he was smart enough to know that like even some small little shit, tiny town paper is worth doing the press. He sure. just knew it was important because it was, no, again, there was no internet. And I ended up doing a big giant story. I think they put it on the front page with like, you know, picture of Gene Simmons and all that. And I went to the show and afterwards he actually sent a thank you note and was like, thanks for the coverage. Like, yeah, I was amazed. So things like that, you know, I, I got to interview Ozzy a couple of times. Oh yeah. He was, was cool. It? Yeah, he was cool. And uh, Lemmy, I interviewed Lemmy. That's awesome. Yep. Um, I interviewed Notorious B.I.G. Oh, really? Which was pretty cool, yeah. How did that go? What, what, wild. <laughs> That's a wild story. <laughs> Again, what? how long you got. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually told this well, story. It's how long you got, you know? Well, <laughs> I, I told this story on uh, on on your brother, uh, Lord Willen's podcast. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. Um, the, the, the short version is um, I was friends with the publicist for, for Bad Boy. And, you know, it was, he, they were like they were a subsidiary of like a larger label. Yeah. So the larger label PR guy used to send me stuff from bad boy. Be like, check this dude. I'll check. So he's this sent me a, a, a package. And again, it all came in the mail. It was 1994. And he's like, um, you know, you got to check out this dude, you know, notorious B I G, you know, Biggie Smalls. He's, He's the next big thing. I'm, yeah, I've heard that a hundred times. Yeah, of so course. You hear that I listened. Day, yeah. He sent me uh, Ready to Die. And I listened and I was like, holy shit. I was like, this shit is dope. You know, this yeah, is yeah. good. And he's like, he's playing in Providence you know, this night you want to go and hooks me up with a couple of tickets. I bring my buddy and he's like, do you want to interview him after the show? And I was like, yeah, sure. So he sets it up and he's like, after the show, go to the side stage and find Sean and Sean yeah. Puffy, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and no one knew who he was at the time. I didn't yeah. know. It was just his manager. So show ends and I go find Sean and uh, Sean's like, yeah, man, uh, come around the back and we'll do the interview on the bus. So I'm like, all right, cool. So we go around to the back and the bus, you know, I'm waiting outside and, no biggie. And then Sean comes back and he's like, you know, we're actually going to do it at the hotel. So go to the hotel and he sends us to the hotel across the street. So we go back there and now it's like, you know, two in the morning. Yeah. It's like a Tuesday night. I yeah. got to work the next morning. Yeah. Yeah. At like five 30 in the morning. Yeah. Like five yeah. 30 in the morning to cover yeah. the police. I got to go see the cops in so, the morning. So basically you know? you're going to leave that interview and go right to work. Go home, yeah. sleep for like an hour and yeah. then go home. So, and I said that to my buddy, I'm like, dude, I got to get up at like four hours. He's like, ah, come on, man. Come on. Come on. Come on. So we hung out. And um, we're hanging out in the hotel room. He tells us the room number, waiting in the hallway. And all of a sudden, you know, they come walking down the hall, and it's Sean and, and Biggie. And I, I don't really know who he is, but I figured it out. And yeah. they, they're arguing. They were fighting about money. And Biggie was like, I got a couch coming tomorrow, motherfucker. He's like, where's my money? You know, he's like, <laughs> and Sean's like, it's coming, Big. I'm going to, and don't worry about it, man. And they're like fighting about money. And they come up and they're arguing like he did. And then they come up and there's me and my friend and there was like a, a girl from like the Brown University newspaper and there was like a dude from like the local radio station. Yeah. And um, he's like, hey, he instantly turned into like a pro again. He was just like, hey, what's up? How are you guys doing? You know, come on in and opens the door and we sit down and, and we start, you know, interviewing. You know, he's going around the circle, you know, answering questions and all that. And um, all of a sudden little C's from Junior Mafia comes in and he throws a big giant bag of weed on the table <laughs> and he spins up a big giant blunt and passes the blunt around. I'm not a big weed smoker, but yeah, yeah. you know, that night I was, you know, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, like yeah. he's like, you know, I'm, I was sitting next to Biggie and he like sitting there puffing on the blunt. He just handed it to me. And I'm like, I'm not going to not smoke it. You yeah, know? So yeah. I just, you know, take two and pass. And, and it was just a great night and he was just a really down to earth dude. And, you know, he talked about his wife and his daughter and he talked about the presses of the industry and, you know, talked about the East Coast, West Coast, and the fighting and all that shit. But I found him to be really uh, intelligent and and uh, and passionate and smart. And you know, it, it was it was quite a moment. And then you know, he died shortly after, and I was like, "Wow, that's crazy!" Yeah, it's crazy. But that's the you know that's you know it's important. <clears throat> Some of the best things in life is just is just is just sticking it out and being there. Yeah. 
you know, and you never know, like you never know when that, that's like a moment that, you know, it sucks. You lost some sleep that night, but that's like, you know, some historical Wouldn't trade shit. it for the world. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, yeah, you know yeah. and that's important, man. I've had a lot of moments like that where I, I seize the moment, and, you know, I think I'm a big believer in that, you know, like, you know, if I put it this way, you know, nine eleven, you know, that morning, I could have told my boss, you know what, I can't go down there. Yeah. You know, I, I got I got I got something I gotta do this weekend and you know, my, my wife or I, I could have made up some shit, you know. But I knew it was an opportunity to cover history. Yeah. So I just was like, I gotta go. Yeah. And I went. Everything goes aside. When yeah. that shit happens, everything. You know, daughter, family, everything. And that's not fair, but it was all part of my journey. Yeah. You know, it brought me to to these books, you know. Absolutely. But like you said, it's it's uh, probably a good thing that your wife's in the industry yeah. kind of understands, you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Like, you know, like, you know, the, yeah. you know what comes with the job, you know? Yeah, she did, you know, but it's still, you know, sometimes she'll be like, why? Why do you got to do, you know, yeah. sometimes the book, she's like, why do you got to do? And I'm like, you really ask me that? Like, yeah, yeah. you know why? You know, and then she's like, I know, I, I, I just be careful, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. So again, I'm not I'm not going out into war here, but sure, you know, yeah. I I definitely like I go the extra mile for the story. Yeah, I don't put myself at personal risk. I don't think, but you know, I I gotta. Yeah, well, you there's some things you, you don't know if you are or not. Like you, you said with the bombing, know. like yeah. no one in the city knew what the hell was going on. Like you know, like there could have been yeah. bombs anywhere. They were putting them in garbage cans and crazy yeah. shit. Like you know, who the fuck knows, right? Yeah, you uh, just don't know. But um, yeah, man, any. Anything else that you know that we haven't touched on that's important? I mean, we talked about a lot, yeah. a lot of interesting. Shit, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a, it's it's like a, a, a you know, and I would love to continue conversation down the road when other when other shit comes out. Um, but you know, you know, you don't have the typical journey. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and you've been neither been, do you. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no. But that's why it's it's interesting to talk. You know, yeah. like um, the. Uh, but what I was going to say is that, like, you know. Uh, you know, it's always interesting. I love, I love showing that to people that like, you know, there's things in life that, like you said, you got to seize it, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, short, you, you're responsible short, for your path. You know? Like, you know, you ain't happy in your day job and you, there's other shit you want to do. Like you don't know where it's going to take you if you, unless you take the chance, you might fail, but then yeah. you find some other shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's, you know, I've just always found that, you know, there's no time like the present. Don't say no to any opportunity. Yeah. Take a shot. You know, the old say, you know, my dad's an old sports guy and you know the old saying is you know you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take yeah take a fucking shot you know yeah. what i mean and that's kind of the way i've lived my life and i you know am i a millionaire am i perfect am i great no i'm not but i love what i do every day is fun every day is an adventure and you know what if it's not then i can go change it you know yeah. we're in charge of our own destiny a lot of yeah. people don't understand that yeah. we are and it's you know it's never easy i yeah. guess you know no and my journey wasn't easy but you know, it's easier now, yeah. but I had some hard times, you know, when I was younger and, you know, times where I was like, shit, you know, I'm working in a business that I put my whole life into and it's falling apart, yeah. the newspaper business. And I was like, what have I done? What am I going to do? And all my friends are working at finance firms, making six figures and buying houses and I'm living in a shitty apartment in Brockton. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's like, but it's all part of the journey. So yeah, absolutely. You know, I'd love to come on again next time I want to interview you, though. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so just out of curiosity, like, you know, you go from working a paper where there's, like, a routine and then, you know, and then there's crazy shit popping up. That, But, you know, like you said, like, you might have to go to the, the police station in the morning, the courthouse in the afternoon, but you kind of know what you're going to do. And then if some breaking shit comes, you got to cover that. But now going into, like, where you're doing your own thing, <laughs> your books, like, do you have, do you find that you have to, like, kind of maintain, like, a, um, like a, like a, like a, like a, uh, a schedule or like a you know like do you have to because now you're responsible for your own shit yeah, like yeah. You, you can you know like whether you know so do you have to do you have like a writing schedule or do you have like something you stick by to, to, to kind of like a little bit i do i try to you know but it's it, i'll admittedly it's hard like there's yeah. there's days where i'm like oh man i just don't feel like doing this today and like i'll go outside and like clean the yard or rake some you know do yeah, something yeah. else or make some food, you know, for the kids or whatever. But, um, you know, I think it's like you, you know, it's like, you know, you just gotta, you gotta be disciplined to yourself. I mean, at the end of the day, I know when my deadline is and if I don't meet it, I'm not getting paid and yeah. I can't pay for my bills. So sure, yeah. I got to get it done. So I always get it done. And if it means I have to work at three in the morning, I'll get up at three in the morning, you know, and I, and I, I'm, I'm a little bit 
weird like that where I'm not a creature of habit. I'm all yeah. over the place. Like, huh? you, are you a need the pressure guy? Yeah, yeah. I am. I am and, I, and, and I'm real weird. Like, I'm like, uh, I won't sleep, but then I'll sleep. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just, I'm all over the place. It's really based on need, you know? Sure. If, if things are slow, I guess maybe this is the way to put it. Um, someone told me once in the newspaper business, like, if it's slow, let it be slow. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And I kind of live my life that way. Like, it can always be busy, and it usually is. But when it's slow, let it be slow, man. Yeah, like, just yeah. chill and enjoy that downtime. So, you need a recharge period. You need a recharge, yeah. And yeah. Vacations are good. You know, I, I like to get outside. I'm a big skier. I get out in the woods yeah. and shit and, you know, try, sure. to, try to get some downtime. Go for bike rides with my kid, you know. You still, you still active in music at all? Like listening? Well, or? I was before all this, you yeah, know. I yeah. mean, I was going, you know, it's funny. Uh, this is the first year of my life since I was 13 that I won't go to a show, you know? Yeah. I didn't go to any shows before this show started. Said, I know? said that same exact sentence, I think, with the exact same age, uh, just to somebody this week. 13? I was like, I was like I, this is the first time since I'm 13 where I've gone a whole, yeah. probably a whole year. The last yeah. show I saw was Murphy's Law in March. March of 2019? Yeah. It's yeah, probably the, the, the last show in Boston. Yeah. Literally, the the all the shutdown stuff was happening yeah. the next day. Oh, you went in 2020. Oh, March. 2020. Yeah, 2020, yeah. yeah. I didn't go to a show in 2020. Oh. I hadn't made it to any shows yet. I, I saw my buddy's band play, but it was like a bar thing. But, yeah. Um, the last like show I went to was I saw the Pixies at Big Night Live in Boston in like December okay. of 2019. Yeah, yeah. So no shows this year. So that's a bummer. But in answer to your question, yeah, I mean, I, I'm... I'm not writing a ton of music these days, like writing for music publications, but every now and then someone will be like, Hey, you want to do a piece and I'll do something. But yeah, I s try to stay up on everything. You know, I listen to a lot of everything. I, I, you know, lately I've been listening to like, um, I don't know, like I listen to some hardcore, I listen to some metal, like yeah. a big, like behemoth guy. Sure. I've been listening to, um, behemoth's one of those bands. Like you said, I'm not comparing them to Yanni at all, yeah, yeah. but I was never a big behemoth guy. But then I went to go see him because at the gates and Behemoth played. I was, it was like a year. I and was half at ago. I was at that show. Yeah, yeah. and I, and literally their their stage show and what they put into that show like converted me. I yeah, was it's like, insane. I, I was like, this is fucking crazy. Insane. Like, and, you know what? I saw them. Um, Behemoth opened up for Cannibal Corpse, and I'm a big Cannibal Corpse guy. Like yeah. I love that speed metal and thrash and shit. Yeah, yeah. And like they just could it, after Behemoth ended, it was like the room was empty. You yeah. know, it was like the they just sucked all the energy out of the room. Like Cannibal Corpse, as powerful and as energetic yeah. as they are, they couldn't match that level of intensity. Yeah, that Behemoth's legit. Like with their live shows, oh, it's, yeah. it's they, intense. You know, and, yeah. And since then, I've heard interviews with with uh, Nar Nar Nurgle, Nurgle, yeah, yeah, yeah smart dude, yeah. smart guy, and and literally the passion for what he does, oh, and yeah. like you know, wanting to deliver. That's yep. something that like is I hold a lot of respect for, and like someone's like a like a real takes the music so serious that yeah. like and what and what they're putting out there like like people are like no that's control freak stuff I'm like no no that's someone that's like really uh, dedicated to his yeah, craft to you know? his craft and it's wants like to you, make sure you know? that it's it's going the right like way. I'm sure sometimes you're the mad scientist back there in the shop you know but yeah. um yeah no I'm you know trying sometimes to I'm just a mad guy <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to listen to as much music as I can you know like I, I I'm trying to find new music I'm, I'm rediscovering old yeah. music and you know I think this is a time you know we haven't talked much I don't want to get too you know, pontificating here, but you know, we're in a pandemic and we have a lot of time to reflect. I think people should be appreciative of that time. Absolutely. And try to find new things to occupy that time that matter to you. Like yeah. it's, it's the kind of time where, you know, think back to before the pandemic, every day was scheduled. You had like a meeting, you had a dinner, you had birthday party, you had yeah. a wedding, funeral, whatever the fuck it was. You grind, were constantly yeah. going, we don't have that anymore. So like use that time, yeah. you know, expand your mind, read shit, watch yeah. shit, listen to shit, yeah. create to, shit. Yeah. Learn new skills, you know? do something. Yeah. Cause I don't think ever in life are you, again, are we going to have a time where there's like so much time to, to do that? Yeah. Like for me, I didn't shut down a day here. So it's a yeah. little different, you know, and I, and a lot of people I don't, but there's a lot of people I know that weren't able to work because their job shut down and, and, and they were going crazy or, or they were doing that. They were like, all right, taking this time to like get into new shit or learn. That's new what shit it's a time for. Yeah, yeah. It's a time for hobbies. It's a time for, you know, projects. And I think most, yeah. you know, most people are figuring that out, but, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I do hope that, you know, all your <laughs> listeners are, uh, 
maximizing their time and yeah, absolutely and being yeah. safe, you know? Yeah. Because if there's a second round of it, like if you didn't do that on the first time and if you just sat there playing PlayStation next time, you're like, there's probably yeah, another one PlayStation's pretty awesome, yeah, though. No, I, <laughs> yeah. If, if, you know, don't worry about getting a PlayStation 5. Worry about, like, fucking developing some new shit. Un yeah. Unless you want to be a video game person, you know? But are you, um, do you do any side uh, work, like, meaning, like, outside of books, are you still, like, writing pieces here and there for for for, for yeah news. yeah I, fr I freelance occasionally and i do a little consulting too like yeah. i do i do some political work like i have some political clients that i do some uh work for you know i'll help them write um op-eds or content for their websites or you know oh, deal with cool. the media for them things like that yeah um you know kind of a hired gun as needed and um you know i'm like you man like i wear a lot of hats and i just try to try to stay busy and you know, you. Yeah. I try to use my mind every yeah. day, and, and use different parts of the brain. Yeah, yeah, just try to bring my skills to where they can be used. And you know, I, I got a kid in college, and I got a seven-year-old, so I'm, I'm pretty busy with You're that. You're pretty too, busy you know? anyway. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Well, hey, wh where can people find out more um, about you, like uh, websites or social media or anything? Yeah. So, so the the website for our production company where we post all the news about our books and movies and all that is it's fortpointmedia.com um that's the name of our company fortpoint media but you know people want to hit me up personally like i post a lot of my stuff on there too you know facebook or yeah. instagram i'm at david m wedge or i'm on twitter at dave wedge so okay people check it out yeah and say I, hello i'll put all that in the show notes too to make it easier because sometimes you go by dave sometimes you go by david so you know, I well, might my, my you know it's my my name it, my my real name is David, but my my author name is Dave, Dave. and so I'm always at Dave Wedge. But yeah. Instagram Dave Wedge was already taken, so oh, okay. <laughs> I yeah. had to go at David M because yeah, that's my real name. Yeah, so you, yeah. yeah, you you had to get a, a, a more professional with <laughs> not, I guess you know, so. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, I mean, um, but it's always Dave, man. Yeah, well, fuck yeah, yeah. man. This was a great, uh, was great. A great talk, and uh, I look forward to doing uh, another one down the road when you got more stuff coming out and 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 and, uh, and talking more about that. Uh, Same here. I, w I wish you luck with the podcast. I, you know, yeah. we got a lot of friends uh, together and I'm, I'm glad you're doing this and yeah. you know, it's good stuff. So keep it up. Absolutely, man. I appreciate it. I'm going to uh, sign off here right now. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Check engine light on. Take the guesswork out of your check engine light with O'Reilly Veriscan. It's free and provides a report with solutions based on over 650 million vehicle scans verified by ASE certified master technicians. And if you need help, we can recommend a shop for you. Ask for O'Reilly Veriscan today. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with Audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller, find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.